meeting West. Shanghai meeting supercars. Together, the two will create a new era. An era of Australian motorsport many thought they'd never see. V8 supercars bringing two very different worlds together. This is your international home of motorsport, Network 10. that has fascinated the West since Marco Polo arrived there 700 years ago. Exotic, mysterious and massive. Today it is still as great a challenge in many ways as it was all those centuries ago. But there are few bigger culture shocks to the people of China than the roar of a fleet of V8 supercars and the outrageous antics of the men who drive them. Hello, I'm Bill Woods. Welcome to this special event in the history of Australian motorsport. Today you'll see a V8 Supercar Championship round in Shanghai. There have been several touring car expeditions overseas since that brand of racing took root in Australia half a century ago. Ever since Tony Gay, Stan Jones and Lex Davison took an old Holden on the Monte Carlo Rally in the 1950s, our leading drivers have been competing in international events all over the world. There have been races staged in New Zealand, and in more recent times, New Zealand has hosted championship rounds. But never before has the championship itself gone as far, or indeed embarked on such a change of identity as this. Years in the planning, months in the preparation. The journey to follow in the footsteps of Formula One and MotoGP began three weeks ago at Eastern Creek, where 32 cars and all their associated equipment were airlifted to Shanghai. Our team has been setting up the telecast all week, and now Lee Diffie joins us trackside. Thanks, Billy, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to round five of the championship. More to the point, welcome to the most spectacular motor racing complex in the world. It may not have the history of an Indianapolis Motor Speedway or Spa, but the facility, the whole setup, is unparalleled. The venue can hold approximately a quarter of a million people. The front straight grandstand, 40,000 alone. And the two UFO-style buildings you'll see a lot of this weekend stand nine storeys above the racetrack. One of them is the media centre, the other one is corporate hospitality. The track and pit lane are so wide that our V8 boys felt a little lost at times early on. The sheer magnitude of this place is just astounding. And this weekend, it's our playground. Today, it's supercars Szechuan style. The V8s cook it up in China with three of the best. Race one, 22 laps, followed by two 30 lappers. Plus, Bruce Lee or Greg Rust. Dazza does Old Town, and Richo talks history. Good crowd on hand here today of locals and also visitors from throughout the Asia Pacific region. As you can imagine, this was a massive undertaking for Avesco, carting 32 V8 supercars and everybody involved with this championship from Australia to Shanghai. And to get a closer look at this, we sent in our own Lieutenant of Logistics, Neil Crompton, to take a closer look. International traveller. Travelling halfway around the world is commonplace in Formula One and also for MotoGP. But for V8 Supercar, taking 32 of our cars, all the spare parts that go with them and of course the support equipment, from here at Avalon in Victoria, direct to Shanghai, China, has been something of a massive organisational and logistical challenge. Two 747-400 series freighter aircraft were chartered by Gibson Freight, an Australian company with extensive experience in flyaway motorsport. Gibson Freight have been working with Avesco for approximately 18 months to put the package together. It's important to get an optimum package for a circus travelling overseas. As soon as the chequered flag dropped at Eastern Creek 14 days ago, V8 supercar teams began the process of packing for the history-making race meeting in China. Each team positioned its car onto a purpose-built double car pallet using a forklift. The cars were then tied down with special aircraft certified straps. The pallets, designed and built by O'Brien Aluminium in Sydney, were moved onto the aircraft by a main deck loader using a roller system. Once inside the aircraft, the cars and containers were secured with locks and extra strapping. 
Each car has a dedicated 17 cubic metre support equipment container housing spares and tools. A communal pallet carried the team's spare engine, two gearboxes and a maximum of 16 wheels. Inside each of the 747 freighters, 16 cars and their support containers are loaded onto the lower deck with the communal pallets and the additional containers on the upper deck. If this were a conventional Boeing 747-400 and it was configured for passengers, I'd be sitting in about row 45A, surrounded by 350 of my nearest and dearest friends, and the takeoff weight would be about 360 ton. But in this purpose-built and configured freighter, with all the cars and all this equipment, the takeoff weight's going to be almost 400 tons. The cost of this purpose-built air freight equipment is worth more than $500,000 with the total air freight bill coming to more than $1 million. When you consider that each V8 supercar is worth more than $400,000 and each engine $100,000, the total payload exceeds a value of $20 million. It's been a massive operation for Gibson Freight, Avesco and the race teams, and the homework translated into a flawless execution as the cars departed Australia. This knowledge and exercise provides the basis now for Avesco to more readily consider any future overseas opportunities. Well, he's not really our Lieutenant of Logistics. He's our V8 supercar expert commentator, Neil Crompton. Uh, I never thought I'd say good to see you in Shanghai. Neither did I. <laughs> it is really quite extraordinary. And it's not just a question of it being an amazing racetrack. This is an amazing sporting stadium. It can hold its head up amongst anything that we see anywhere in the world. Let's have a closer look at it. This is a modified track by comparison to the Grand Prix circuit. 4.6 kilometres clockwise in direction, very complicated in the middle. Got a lot of people thinking hard about how to set up a V8 supercar for it. Complicated through turn one, a 250k approach. There's the chicane four and five where we rejoin the Grand Prix circuit. Very tight and twisty through this midfield section and then through this long right-hander that seems to go on forever with a positive camber that takes you onto the back straight. 1,455 metres in length, the tallest dip we have, 280 kilometres per hour to a huge braking area in the hairpin at 12 and then leading back onto the front straight in this magnificent theatre. With only one two-hour practice session on this brand new circuit for V8 supercars, qualifying in the top 10 shootout brought with it more pressure than ever. Let's take a look at the qualifying highlights and a surprise first up, a nice surprise from Dodo Racing's Jamie Wincup. Terrific job from this young fella in the Dodo Racing team. They had an intermittent misfire with the car on day one. They had the problem with Jason Richards' car at Eastern Creek, but he was in total harmony with his car and punched out a good time. Ditto for Paul Radisich with the team Kiwi Racing Holden Commodore. He's totally in sync with this car. He loves driving it. It's been quick. Look in the background here for Marcus Ambrose flashing the headlights in frustration, looking for a clear gap. Had some brake problems this weekend is not totally on top of the car. He won't reveal what the drama is, but he's not in sync with it. And he's further back than we would expect to see Marcus. But this bloke, totally on top of his game throughout the weekend, fast in the wet, fast in the dry. The car well behaved, Mark relaxed and getting good speed out of it. And there's a trend developing here because for the last three race meetings, Mark Scape has been the fastest driver at the conclusion of qualifying leading into the top 10 shootout. And the man who's been on pole for the last three, Craig Lowndes, was second quickest. Good work too from Wing Cup finishing in there ahead of Ambrose and Paul Radisic in the top 10, the first half of qualifying. Second half, we look back inside the top 20 and nice work from Paul Morris to be in there. Frustration for Russell Ingle. He too, like his teammate, was not in harmony with his car and Paul Wheel. While well, he's improving in the whole qualifying process. He was one position ahead of Jason Barguana. Now let's talk top 10 shootout. There was a lot on the line here for Lowndes, a fourth consecutive pole, but the pressure was on this bloke. And you can see, just looking carefully at this car, Lee, that stability is eluding them at the moment. They don't quite have the balance that they used to having. This was an interesting lap from Craig Lowndes. G drove hard through turn one. He launched it off the curbing there. He made a mistake in the chicane at turns four and five. By contrast, Stephen Richards' lap was extremely smooth. Not ultra fast in the first sector, but very, very quick where it counts in that complex in the middle of this track. 
Like Sector 2, he really did a great job and I expect him to be very strong this weekend, but boy, this bloke was fantastic. He approached the final corner very differently to everybody else. He kind of came out on a shallower angle, which I think had the effect of lengthening the straight for Mark, but he's looked very strong all weekend and from the position where he's at at the moment, provided he gets a half decent start, which has eluded him, he might be okay. So we take a look at the results. This is how they will line up. And Mark Scaife, our third different pole sitter this year. He breaks the Lowndes steamroller. And Stevie Richards will share the front row. That's a very different looking front row in 2005. Lowndes had to settle for fifth place. And Marcus Ambrose, seventh isn't too bad. It's his worst of the year, though. We'll see if he can rebound. And Jamie Wincup, pleasingly, in the top ten. So an interesting qualifying and top 10 shootout procedure leading into the first of a three race weekend. Our Greg Rust is with the top man. Well, it must be nice from an historical standpoint to have the first ever V8 supercar pole position here in China. But for you, Mark Scaife, it's your first in nine months. That must make it even more special. Yeah, I mean, our qualifying was great last year. Uh, we had uh, some really good results, but uh, we haven't done the best job so far this year. So, uh, you know, to have uh, pole at Shanghai is a, is a great, uh, you know, effort from, from all of our guys because we've had no data and we've had to work pretty hard. So it probably makes it a bit, uh, you know, even, even better in terms of how the results uh, turned out for us. It is a wonderful, impressive venue, but it is such a different racetrack to anything else we're used to on our calendar. Has it been more difficult to get used to this track compared to other new tracks we've gone to in the championship in the past? Look, it probably is because the style of the circuit is nothing that we've seen before. Um, most of the corners actually have a closing radius, which means they tighten up as you get round the corner. Um, mostly in Australia, our, our corners open out at the end, which um, probably suits these cars a little better. But when, you, when we've come here, we've had to try to get our brain around it. And I mean, it's the same for everybody. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's in, in that respect, it's actually quite an analytical good thing to do. The first thing you did yesterday was go out and burn 10 of your allocated 30 laps in that practice session to learn the track. Others were a little more conservative going out lap in not spending that, that amount of time. How much does that investment help you in terms of getting sorted for the track, do you think? Well, I wanted to do two things, Rusty. I, I wanted to go out and not only learn the circuit, but I also, because it was wet, I wanted to go and run in the wet because, you know, we don't know what the conditions are going to be like. If it rains, we want to be able to have a good car in those sorts of conditions also. So, I mean, I did it for two reasons. In the end, it's, it's worked pretty well for us. I know you're pleased about getting pole. What you want is a conversion. Go out there and do it. Good luck. Thanks, Rusty. Thanks, mate. Well, Jamie Wincup made the top ten. His second one so far of his career in V8 supercars. First one was 03 in Winton this weekend, but disappointing. They've put you from ninth back to ten, Jamie. You were late getting out pit lane. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we tried to make a few changes in between qualifying and the shootout, and unfortunately, yeah, we were about two seconds late crossing the line to uh, to get the car in pit lane. But, hey, we're in tenth position. Uh, that's a very good spot to start, so we're, we're all pretty happy. What brings that on? Obviously, we've gone to a round where it's a level playing field. How's the circuit been to you? Well, you're exactly right there. Uh, the, no one here has got 10 years' experience uh, on this circuit, which is the case on some other tracks in Australia. It's a level playing field. We all come, we all have a go, and um, you know, I'm just doing what I usually do and just try to get this car around the track as fast as I possibly can. And hey, we're up the front, but uh, the, the team, Dodo Racing, is doing a fantastic job. Jason's very, very quick also. Uh, we've got to make sure we change that, or get that speed into, into race mode um, and try to pick up some good valuable points. I hope this is a good result for you today. Yeah, thank you very much. We lo love the track and love being here and looking forward to a good result. Thank you. Thanks. Great young guy, Jamie Wincup. We hope he can convert his top 10 start into a solid result. We've got three races to get stuck into this weekend in Shanghai. We do it China style when we return. Shanghai is such a diverse and colourful city. Later, Daryl Beatty leads the charge and takes in the sights and sounds of the old Shanghai. <laughs> We send Greg Rust up the river as he takes us on a tour of the Bund. But next, a new chapter begins in Australian motorsport, race one of the V8 supercars from Shanghai, China. The bright lights of Shanghai provide a stunning backdrop to the V8 supercar adventure in China. The city embraced the drivers and teams in style at a grand official welcome in Shanghai's most eye-catching landmark, the Oriental Pearl TV Tower. 
happy to be here like tonight and uh, you know to really feel the um, you know the warmth that the um, the Chinese have put on for us and looking forward to getting the car. A little bit of a dream up to date. I think um, all the drivers and teams are pretty happy if um, we don't actually work at the racetrack this weekend and continue looking around. Everyone's pretty excited and most people are actually um, visiting Shanghai for the first time this year so everyone's enjoying it a lot. The road was hard but look we're here have a look at this how good's this? The cars have arrived the plane didn't crash we all got a good seat we've lobbed here we're drinking beers we're having the time of our life. The welcome reflects China's determination and passion to develop top-level motor racing as a popular sport for its people. Team owner Gary Rogers could not have wrapped it up more succinctly or correctly than that. Everyone has had a great time so far, particularly the crowd. Look to the right of your screen there. There is a substantial crowd here to watch the first of three races this weekend. We are almost set to go racing here in Shanghai for the first time ever, but first up, Let's talk the hot topic, the Zinger hot topic. We remind you that KFC Zinger Burger is the official burger of V8 Supercar Racing. To lodge your hot topic, all you need to go to is rpmlive.tv. We encourage you to send in your questions and your hot topics. We congratulate round four winner Stan Burt from Newtown in New South Wales. And his Zinger hot topic for Neil Crompton is, how does an international round benefit the sport, Crompo? It's a question that's being asked by a lot of V8 supercar fans. It's a very good question, and I think the answer is a kind of multi-layered answer, this one, because clearly it uh, focuses international motorsport and general community attention on V8 supercar, which is a great thing. It probably opens up a number of other commercial opportunities for race teams, and that's very important. And I think one of the points that's been a little bit overlooked from time to time in this discussion is that uh, the series is not about to embark on a mission to take... Uh, the whole circus overseas on a repeated basis. The charter that the Australian V8 supercar company has with CAMS is for uh, a minimum of 10 domestic races and uh, a maximum of four away games. And of course we go to New Zealand and now China. So well, there still could be potential for uh, some other trips away, but uh, we'll always be a domestic series. So these are real just you know, highlight events rather than us taking away our precious sport from Australia. Let's deal with a couple of key issues uh, coming out of the driver's briefing, which was a very interesting driver's briefing. We were there, and I'll let you explain them, Prompa. Well, quite a few of the drivers have been talking about the incident in race one, turn three at Eastern Creek, and they were seeking clarification from the investigating and prosecuting officer, Peter Wallerman, and driving standards observer, Colin Bond. They wanted to understand their interpretation of what happened, and Colin explained to the 32 drivers that, in his view, shared, I might mention, by Peter Wallerman and others uh, in the stewards' camp that Mark Scaife was the overtaking car as they exited turn two on approach to the right-hand turn three. And as such, he needed to afford racing room to Marcus, who was fully pinned up to the right-hand side of the circuit, couldn't go any further to the right. And uh, it wasn't an under-braking or B-pillar scenario. And uh, the emphasis that they wanted to provide the guys in the room was that, uh, that only look at race two if you need an example of how people can go side by side through that corner like for example Scaife and Richards in the second race and that's what they were looking to do. The other one was about the restarts at Eastern Creek, Craig Lowndes was at the point of that. Yeah. Well Craig was trying a technique and you see it in NASCAR a bit where he's trying to just confuse the field and blast away by jumping on and off the brakes and up and down uh, on the accelerator and uh, that caused a little bit of mid-pack drama as people were splayed off in all directions trying to avoid the rest of the pack bunching up so they've ruled out those kinds of activities at the restart and they've asked the drivers to once they make the determination that they're going to go once they launch that's it they can't back out of it three race format this weekend the first race 22 laps the following two are 30 lappers this one kicks us off and there you see the pit window, five to 15 laps for this 22 lap event. Mark Scape on pole position for the first time, as illustrated on the Talon Tough Tools grid. We congratulate him for that. He has almost got there several times this year, but not quite. And Stephen Richards, a very healthy qualifying position. The topic of the day at the moment, Neil, is tyres. Will they last? Where will they burn off? What will get the most wear? What are your thoughts? Well, I just did a scoot down pit lane to see what everybody's saying, and they're all saying, watch the left rear. I think tyre wear could be an issue here. Certainly the tyres are degrading lap on lap in their speed. Sometimes we're seeing a step off of anywhere between half a second to a second per lap in the first few laps. They're going to have to nurse them. They'll have to be very careful of brakes too because 
that heavy braking application into 12 is then followed by another one very soon after at 14. Some of them are talking about a thing called knockoff where the front brakes aren't fully effective. They're locking the rear brakes and so we'll keep an eye on that. Ambient temperature is currently 28 degrees, Neil. On track it is 38. I've just run past the chairman, Tony Cochran. Big smiles on his face. A huge moment here. Big crowd. Awesome. Quite often the phrase, this is history in the making, is used all too often or loosely, but this truly is. V8 supercars offshore in Shanghai, China for the very first time. And so far this weekend, so good. The race meeting has gone to plan. Everyone has enjoyed the week leading up, whether it be shopping in the markets or the various media activities. It's been a relaxed lead up to this race, but now it's the business end. It's time to get serious. Qualifying in the shootout out of the way and the multi-time champion on pole position. Supercars, Shanghai style. Let's do it. And Stephen Richards blows Scape away off the line. Terrific start from the Castrol Perkins driver. Scape slots into second. Third is Paul Radisic. He holds Greg Murphy off. Scape looking on the inside of Richards. Oh, we've got a car turn. It's Greg Ritter. Greg Ritter, some nose to tail contact down there in the approach area to turn one. He's okay. It doesn't look like he's buried in the gravel. Dumbrell's gone off as well. He's on the access road trying to crawl back on. He went off there on Friday and it caused some drama. Oh, trouble here on the way down to four. That was Lowndes getting very twisted up with Stephen Johnson. That was close. Good catch, Craig Lowndes. Scape is all over Richards at the front though. The battle for the lead is on. Meanwhile, they're sorting themselves at the back of the pack. Is Stephen Ellery in trouble, is it? Yes. Is it on? Yeah, it is Ellery. Meanwhile, Stephen Richards leads the way. Scape another ordinary start. He won't be happy about that. You don't want to give away that pole advantage. They don't come to you terribly often in this business. Lowndes is sliding around. I think he's got a problem. Jamie Wincup is tucked in there as well. He's ahead of Stephen, Stephen Johnson, rather. Radisic has got Murphy and Kelly on his heels. Ingle trying to regroup. He's already got past Jason Bright. And here come the hungry pack. First time down the in excess of one kilometre long straight. Murphy. Oh, yes, I think he's far enough up the inside of Radisic and carts Paul out wide and that'll allow, I think, Todd Kelly to come up and take a spot as well. Marcus is in there as well. This is the final corner onto the pit straight. Very costly there for Paul Radisic. Two positions lost, possibly even three as Ambrose zeroes in, but up front it's Richard Scape. First lap down of the 22. Team boss David John at Team Kiwi Racing just prior to the start of this race and his concern was that the Team Kiwi Commodore may be compromised in horsepower terms. He said the front straight and that 1.4k back shoot is where it would hurt them the most. On board there with Marcus Ambrose through turn one and you could see that it's just a corner that goes on and on and on. It's been a real talking point for the drivers as they try to unravel the mysteries of getting through there quickly in these cars that don't particularly like Big direction changes like that. Stephen Richards, the race leader, told you and I, Neil, just before the start of this race, it just goes on and on forever, that you can't turn your head far enough to the right to see where you're supposed to be going. Yeah, it tightens up as you get to turn two. David Bernard with damage to the left rear tyre there and bumper. And the problem is with the wings on the seats and the hands device and the limited peripheral vision from the helmets anyway, it's actually quite difficult to sight the apex of the corner and it descends to the apex of turns two and three. The general feedback is this track hasn't been as quick as they thought. Zinger replay of the start. Watch Richards fly. The escapee had to double dip. You can hear in the background there. Just uh, cycle the clutch pedal to get himself mobile on the way into turn one. And look at that giant amphitheater with the stadium seats up to the left. Have a look here at Greg Ritter in the middle of the pack. Uh, can't see. I think it might have been the second of the triple eight entries and Paul Dumbrell taking evasive action and this was a real scary moment look at that Craig Lowndes and Stephen Johnson I don't think Craig was aware of the fact that Stephen was there and that allowed Jason Richards to also make a move Russell Ingle taking advantage of Jason Bright and then Stephen Ellery 
getting a bump, I believe. I'm not sure who made contact with him there and it turned him around. Oh, there's the damage. That's the reason why there was damage on the back of Bernard's right. car. He made contact with one of the Gary Rogers Valvoline entries. Scaife, the fastest car on track, 151-41 last time round. Richards locks up. He's feeling the pressure from Scaife. Through turns one, two. This is the most difficult section on the circuit. And Richards is under pressure. This is the area where they depart the Grand Prix circuit, the blind approach to four, it's a little chicane five, and they open up to a right-hander next for six, it goes on, it goes through about 180 degrees, this is six. Scafey looks like he's got a bit of speed, you can tell that Stephen's car is just sliding around a little. Seven, and then seven and eight are a little bit like the middle of Queensland Raceway, squirt at the throttle, off a gear change, then they open the cars up a bit here for the braking run, to turn nine, it's a hard left, and then this never-ending right that takes you to the back straight. It's the left hand at nine. Big direction change here, some cars not handling it well. Gear shift, there it is. And then there'll be another one also with load on the car that takes them to this massive back straight. From apex to apex, 1,455 metres, Scapey in the gutter. I love that corner there, Neil. It's like a NASCAR track or like a motocross berm. They can tuck in and it spins them and sends them onto the back straight. Straight. Look at Scafe here. Rick Kelly is already in the garage. It's been a troublesome weekend for Team Buick. Oh, he just pitches the rears on the way in there. He's got a lot of pressure on Stephen. Some pedal dramas for Rick Kelly. I'm hearing him talk on the radio. And Bernard limping back. Pressure for Stephen Richards through the final turn. Beneath the media centre, completing another lap. The fastest man on the track so far is Scafe. A 51-4. They'll click those numbers one more time. Shortly the pit window will open for the compulsory stop for tyres. No trouble with straight speed. Ah, straight problem. line speed. Problem. Oh yeah, he has damage on the front there. Scaife. How significant is it? It's a fair old punch in the front left-hand corner of that car. Not sure where that happened. Does it affect the brake ducting and the aero on this car? Was it one of the tyre bundles? They have been hitting that one through turn three. Talk about damage, guys. Just quickly have a look at this tyre. If anyone runs off in the gravel trap, which a few have already, the rocks are tearing these tyres apart. So anyone that runs off into those and try to gas it up and get back onto the track quickly, the damage is quite significant with those rocks. Another problem for Greg Ritter here. As we look at that Dunlop control tyre, you can see the markings on it actually note the tread depth on the tyre. They start out with four millimetres of uh, slick racing tyre tread depth available to them. And I think in particular the left rear tyre around this track is going to take some work today. Behind Richards and Scaife, it's Todd Kelly, Greg Murphy, Radisic, Ambrose, Lowndes, Jason Richards, 8, Jamie Wincup, 9, and Russell Ingle, 10. The tough start to the weekend for Car 15 continues. Rick Kelly, the depression that he was talking about with one of the pedals before, Neil, is the clutch. They have a clutch problem in this car, and it looks like it's game over for the first race for him. We keep a watchful eye on the front end of Mark Scaife's HRT Commodore. The front left, look at it. Starts to just... Send little smoke signals at high speed, at maximum speed on the back straight, but through cornering, it's not too bad. That was a good shot of it. I, I don't think it's a major drama, but uh, I reckon you're right, Lee. He's clouded the tyre bundle at some point. So the order is Richard Scape, Todd Kelly, Greg Murphy, Paul Radisish, Marcus Ambrose, 51 2 this lap for Stephen Richards, fastest so far. Ambrose Lowndes, Richards, Wincup, Ingle in the 10, Bright, Johnson, Tanda Morris, Wheel, Barguana, Matt White. Cam McConville, Simon Wills, Glenn Seaton, that's your top 20. I wonder if Ingle had a problem that last lap. Jason Bright has got through on the Caltex Ford. He's making good headway. Marcus Ambrose fighting further back in the pack. He's sixth at the moment and doing it a little tougher than he's used to. We're off, we're up, we're into a good race rhythm here in Shanghai and it's Stephen Richards who leads the way. Richards has responded to Mark Scaife's challenge. He now holds the fastest lap of the race, but Scaife's pressure is relentless. He's not worried about that damage on the front left and continues to hound Richards. You can see the gap there, second to third. Todd Kelly has some catching up to do. That gives us a graphic look at just the enormity of this grandstand here as they click over another lap, five down. 0.3 of a second was the official margin between these two into turn one. 
And this onboard shot just shows how far around this corner loops. They've got to get back to second about there, and then it ducks down to the right. This is the apex they're having trouble seeing, and then continues to descend through turn three. That's where I reckon, Neil, that uh, Scaife has clouded that tyre bundle. Often if you're really close to the back of another car, very easy to unsight the apex of the corner and just whack the tyres. I think it's settled itself down, normalised. There's no problem with the brake ducting. It's further around the front bumper and it was just having a rub at one point. Richo right on the limit there. The HRT gang will be able to take a look at it. The pit window is now open. 5 to 15 for the compulsory tyre stop. Big long stop here too, Lee. Excluding the stationary time, it takes 46 seconds to transit the pit lane here. In this race one, the shorter of the three races this weekend, they'll have started with between about 70 and 80 litres of fuel, depending on their own individual consumption. The lap around here at 100% throttle, you only end up spending 40 odd percent of the lap flat out. It is. They've just asked Mark Scaife whether or not he's being held up because if he is, they want to get him out from under the back of Stephen Richards. Richo's gone defensive, down to the hairpin. He knows that he's coming in this time round. Clear pit lane for Stephen Richards was the message. Look at Scaife hassling him, hounding him. Giving him some help along. And if I was Scaife, I'd do an extra lap or two here because you might actually make a net gain on Stephen. They're both in. I think Scaife's coming in as well. Greg. Just just spoken to HRT team manager Rob Starr. He tells me that they've been glued to that monitor looking at the damage on Scaife's car. They're not overly concerned by it at this stage. Yeah, they've actually elected to leave him out, which I thought they'd do because uh, Stephen's in getting service. They're doing rears only by the look of it. Yes, pretty good stop. Marcus is in as well, Dodo Racing entry. So Mark Scaife with what looked to be a whisker of additional speed over Stephen Richards might make a tenth or two on this lap and that'll be what he is pinning his hopes on. So Scaife now inherits the lead as the number one Pertec Ford is in. Jason Richards running in the top ten. It's been a hold and dominated top ten thus far with about eight of the top ten for the general. Ambrose is gone. You've got to remember, guys, too, that Stone Brothers Racing, when they make adjustments on the run like this, Ambrose car comes good. He struggled throughout qualifying in the shootout because they've tried a different brake package on that car. They've now gone back to what they're used to. They said the car would be strong, so keep an eye on it. I think they did a pretty good stop then too, Darrell, because relative to Stephen, I reckon they actually closed the gap a little bit. Problem here Max Wilson. for Max Wilson, who was quick on Friday, Greg. An absolutely tough stop, a top, a tough stop for Paul Wheel. It took a, a good 15 seconds. They had a problem with the right rear on that car, but contrast that with the pit bay right next door. The HSV dealer team, a brilliant job for Garth Tander. 3.38 seconds, and GT was gone. They renumbered the Max Wilson car to 328 this weekend because in Chinese it translates to profit and success. Not Oops. a bad idea. Well, it hasn't working though. And you can hear Mark Scaife there talking with the boys saying you sure you don't want to do one more lap. They asked him to come in. Who is it that stayed out? Is it Todd Kelly or Mark Scaife? There's the answer. Scaife is in. Pinch the brakes a little just getting to the 40k control line. It's a downhill approach into the I'm pit in lane now. here. And Mark just advising the team that he's in. Such a long lane, they can't see him from there into the pit lane. Hey mate, we're doing left hand side. So they're going to do Close. down the working side of the car, not the rears. This will give them the opportunity to have a look at the damage on the front. Meanwhile, this is Lowndes in for his compulsory. A little tricky down here too, boys, because it's concrete as they venture off the bitumen in pit lane. This is taking a little while longer for Mark Scape. Seven seconds gone already. And they tend to slide a bit on the concrete. Scape rejoins just ahead of Lowndes. Ingle peeling in for his stop. Looks like a drama for Murphy's stop as well. That burnt Mark Scape because they couldn't get the wheel clear. Oh. Marcus Ambrose got out ahead of Mark Scaife. It was costly, Neil. Yeah, he was hurt then because uh, that, the problem with the damage on the front of the car is it failed being able to pull the wheel off and on cleanly. And they burnt valuable seconds trying to get that sorted. They took the opportunity to put some race tape on it as well. I used the term before, the working side of the car, because this is a clockwise circuit and a lot of right-handers, 
it's the left side of the car that does the work. So both left tyres work particularly hard here. There's a lot of concern that turn one is hard on the front left tyre and the general shape of the track is very hard on the left rear tyre. So some different teams approaching their tyre management in different ways. Some doing rear tyres only. Trouble at turn one here, Greg Ritter, Ritter and Paul Dumbrell and Ritter in the wars again. Next up on the Zinger replay sequence, Jason Barguana. This is at the hairpin. Contact from Matthew White in the Brytec Fujitsu Ford. He gets helped out of the way. Jason Barguana was very quick early in the weekend in the wet practice two-hour session, but as soon as it dried up, his handling went away. Second HRT car in. This is Todd Kelly. He was the leader of the race. And Mark Winterbottom is in trouble in the Orcon Ford. Looks like his day is done. So troubles, major troubles for Bernard, for Max Wilson, for Mark Winterbottom. Been a tough start to the weekend. Here's Kelly stop. Oh, skidded way past the marker points on the concrete that Greg referred to before. The actual rattling the wheels on and off was quick and efficient, but the boys hate it when you go past your markers. They went left side too for Kelly, just like Scaife. Daryl. Team Kiwi went the same as well, the working side that Neil mentioned, the left-hand side for Paul Radisic. Also, Jamie Wynn come in, two rears for him, and that car has had a bit of a misfire in it, or a spike in the ECU off throttle. I think there's an interference that moves the coil on that car to try and stop it getting interference, but it spikes to about 9,500. The, the engine doesn't actually rev that, but the the engine control unit or ECU thinks that it has and uh, so it goes haywire trying to sort itself out. They've had terrible problems with it at Eastern Creek and here again this weekend. They've looked at changing everything in the car. They can't get on top of it at the moment. Great stop from the HRT gang for Todd Kelly. They've got him out ahead of Marcus Ambrose and Mark Scaife right in behind Stephen Richards. So these are your top four guys in the race at the moment. And Radisic has joined this chain as well. He should be right in behind those guys. Look at Kelly. Kelly's got plenty of speed. He's going with Stephen Richards. Oh, goodness me. That's a uh, that's a great. Oh, I know what that is. It's a little bit of the drainage on the side of the circuit. Um, when we walk the circuit on Thursday, it lines both sides of the circuit uh, for drainage purposes, and he's whacked that hard. That's the reason that car's pulled over, so that'll have done damage underneath the car for certain, and that's the reason he's abandoned it. There is pressure, major pressure on Stephen Richards. You look at Marcus Ambrose, Mark Scaife, the two who tangled at Eastern Creek, it's on again, but Richards is playing defensive from Kelly. Kelly is the one with all the speed at the moment. He inherited the lead after Richards and Scaife stopped, but now Todd Kelly is the man. He's got good pace. He's in a bad spot here, though, as he comes up to the final corner. How much longer can Stephen Richards hold on? We are almost at the halfway mark. Drivers are discussing how bad the behaviour of their cars is already, and we're only, you know, not even halfway through this race. So if your car isn't working well on this, this track here in China, it seems to amplify whatever the weaknesses you have in the balance of the car. Todd able to use a shallower exit line then off turn three. This is the little chicane turns four and five. There's a lot of concern about drivers straight lining those and they've appropriately placed big tyre bundles right at the apex to keep them all on the black stuff. Good, good stop by Jason Barguana and they've made some wholesale changes in terms of the roll center on that car but in the meantime I'm going to grab a quick word with the team boss Mark Larkham. What's the diagnosis on Mark Winterbottom's car? Well we only very briefly got a message before he came out of the car. He said something to the effect of something come through the car and the, the engine stopped so Rusty really don't know much more at this stage may or may not have seen our, our replay, but it did look like a, a grate or something along those lines has popped up from the circuit, so he feels it's done some serious engine damage? Well, we really don't know. I just got that message. Something something came through the car and the engine stopped, so uh, really not sure what's going on there. Good luck, Mark. OK, thanks, mate. Stephen Richards is doing his best to handle the pressure from Kelly. Kelly's weaving from side to side, looking for an opportunity, a line, an opening to get by. And the rules permit Stephen to move once, which he's done, to a defensive position. They discourage you moving back again, and if it's too aggressive, they will give you a bad sportsmanship or even a, a black flag. Stephen hasn't done that, he just stayed down the right-hand side, but clearly Todd's got pace at the moment. A little battle right behind is an interesting one as well between Marcus Ambrose and Mark Scaife. 
that has remained the same since those guys came together after their respective sequence of pit stops. Lowndes is starting to apply some pretty nice pressure on Radisic as well. Then it's Murphy tucked in behind those guys. 250 kilometres an hour on the approach to turn one, which is quite substantially uphill. Oh, and Richards locks up and it allows Todd Kelly to sneak by. He was there, he was hounding him, he was waiting, and he was in the right position. Nicely through, Todd Kelly, the new race leader. Car 52, Matt White's also going to get a black flag for that infringement down at the hairpin with Barguana, I believe. Yet to pit in this race, Paul Morris and the man Neil was just talking about, Matt White. Here's the Zinger replay move for the lead. It's where the second brake application comes to slow the cars down for, it's really all part of turn one, but it's officially called turn two. And when Stephen grabbed the brake pedal, it just locked up a little, carted him wide, and that allowed Todd cleanly through on the inside. Kelly is not hanging around, he is waltzing away. Now we'll see if Stephen Richards can hang on because Ambrose and Skate are coming on strong. feeling the pressure. Craig Lowndes has got through. Now Greg Murphy's working a line as well, looking to get by the team Kiwi Racing Pilot. Next in the line is Jason Richards for the Dodo team. And it's been a successful weekend in Shanghai for the Dodo Racing Commodores. There's his teammate Jamie Wincup, just two positions back. Race leader is Todd Kelly. This could be the turning point in the championship for Kelly. On corrected positions, he's the race leader. Paul Morris, Matthew White, Greg Ritter, Anthony Tratt. They're still to negotiate the lane. But a 51-0, the last lap for Todd Kelly, underlining the speed that he's got in that car. Got some interesting information, guys. After these pit stop, I just spoke to Dunlop. They, I said to him, what about the rear left-hand tyre on these cars? Like you mentioned, Neil, earlier about the working side of the car. They said around about 80, low 80 degrees in temperature. It's about 10 to 15 degrees higher than anything we see in Australia. So they're working hard. Watch car three. Jason Richards may come on strong as this race progresses. Had a good long chat with Wally Story, the team boss at Dodo Racing, prior to this race. Now, Jason was elbowed out of the top ten shootout to the tune of just two hundredths of a second, and it happened right at the death knell by Stephen Richards. Wally Story has a saying. He says, you don't spend your pennies, and they wanted to keep a set of tyres up their sleeve. They did that. They played the waiting game, but unfortunately, Stephen Johnson got into the shootout. Jason Richards missed out. The upside to that is they have four green tyres in their bank. They put two on in this race. They're saving two for the rest of this weekend's races. So he'll have very good grip available to him at the moment. Paul Radisich under some pressure at the moment, showing 10th. Let's have a look at this mob go through down at the hairpin turn 12. These guys that are effectively battling for the lead of the race. This Radisich we spoke of in that vigorous battle with Murphy at the moment. Stephen Johnson in 15th, Garth Pander, Matthew White's taken his stop go or his drive through and Russell Ingall was behind him. They got to the bottom of the vibration in the Stephen Richards car too, they had a problem with that on Friday, they dropped about 20 minutes trying to find it, they think that it flicked a weight off the tail shaft so they've replaced the tail shaft in that car for this race and it's fine. Championship wise, this is valuable stuff for Stephen Richards. 88 points behind Russell Engel for second and third in the championship coming into this Shanghai round. Effectively, Stephen Richards is second in the race. Engel is well and truly down the order in 13th. Right with Ambrose. Very different approach from those two drivers. In the previous corner, Marcus really hugging and turning in early. Stephen taking a more traditional swooping line. This is the run down to turn nine. Do a very quick direction change here. Left then right, and then this long corner. It actually begins to get banking on it when you come around it. It banks up quite uh, substantially from about here. And rumbling over those ripple strips just shakes the fillings out of your head. That was uncomfortable sitting here. <laughs> Todd Kelly, the race leader, and the fastest lap of the race. He had a successful start to the 05 season with two top tens at the Clipsal 500, then seemed to lose his way and even borderline on doing some silly things. 
at Pukekohe and at Barbagello where it just didn't go his way and a lot of talk around that how much pressure he was under. Well, he's responded. He responded nicely in the last race at Eastern Creek with a solid fourth place, but now he is running strong. Look at the crowd, this massive grandstand that holds 40,000 spectators. First class view of V8 Supercars Best. We climb on board Super Cheap Auto Racing's machine with Greg Murphy and remind you that if you've spent $30 or more at any Super Cheap Auto store and you've already entered the V8 Muscle Car Mania Comp, here's your chance for some bonus entries. Simply SMS the code. This weekend it's HSVLS2, which you can see on Murph's dash. And you can uh, SMS text it as many times as you want. For our Australian viewers, 1977 51 51. And in New Zealand, SMS 88 44. Good luck. This week's winner will get the opportunity to be a part of Super Cheap Auto's pit crew for the Super Cheap Auto Bathurst 1000, including travel, flights, two nights accommodation. Good luck. Get stuck into it. I don't think Greg ended up with the race car that we thought he was going to have. He's just not quite a force out there at the moment. He's been very strong all weekend. Is the order. Morris and Ritter are yet to take their compulsory stop. Ambrose just beginning to get a little closer now to the back of Stephen Richards. If you've just joined us, it's been a very uncharacteristic weekend for Marcus Ambrose. His worst qualifying, and when we say that, not being too dramatic, he started seven, so it wasn't all too bad. But he uh, ran off yesterday and he's, he's locked, locked it up here. He spun there during qualifying, Scapes got through, that's cost him one position, and he's been able to regroup, but now can he respond? Six highs getting wider as he got closer to the corner down there, and, and uh, all of a sudden in the background you heard the rear brakes just locking up. Here it is from outside the car, Zinger replay shows. Actually, he went pretty darn close to giving Stephen a tap down there. It was an easy pass for Mark Scaife. No tyre damage done, but damage done in terms of his position. Looking at the battle for third, it's Todd Kelly, Stephen Richards, now Mark Scaife, and this man here, the Pertec Ford. We ride with Marcus Ambrose. It's turn six, sort of averaging about 115 k's across the front of the corner. Seven back down to about 90 k's. A little bit quicker here through eight. 120 kilometres an hour. Accelerating now up to 210 kilometres per hour. Down to about 80 through here. Short, sharp blip of the throttle up to about 90. Then they kind of have to hesitate again for just a moment. Around 120 k's. Short shift on the engine. Don't chase all the revs or it makes too much oversteer. It makes the rear of the car slide and then start to use all 600 plus horsepower. Paul Morris yet to perform his compulsory pit stop for tyres. He needs to do that now as he comes in. 5 to 15 was the pit window and that's exactly where we are now. Max, obviously there's an issue with the car. We saw some water run near the bottom of it. What's the problem? Yeah, it seems that it's just a uh, rock came from somewhere and just hit it, it went through the radiator and made a big hole in it. So we are losing water and the engine, engine temperature was going too high, so it had to stop, unfortunately. The engine's OK other than that, just replace the radiator. Yeah, we stopped early enough, so the engine's OK. So it was just a shame the car was going right and uh, we did not finish the race, so it's a shame. Thanks, mate. Thank you, there. Well, for the WPS4 team, it's been a tough start to the weekend for you, David Bernard. Just give us your take on what happened. I don't know, Rusty, everyone was sort of racing pretty hard there the first corner. All I'm trying to do is keep out of trouble so we can finish some races. And um, I couldn't tell you what happened. I got hit pretty hard from behind um, going into the corner and coming out of turn two. Someone just whacked me in the side of turn three, I think it was. Someone just whacked me really hard in the side and I climbed over their front wheel and it's, um, put us out. So Initially, you were concerned by the watts linkage, but at the end, was it a power problem, a battery problem? I haven't looked at the wheel, but it must have broken the wheel because I had that feel about it when you break the watts linkage. It was wandering all over the road, then the tyre went flat and caught up. So we limped back, and um, all it was was a tyre and a wheel. Thanks, David. Thank you.
Looked like one of the uh, Gary Rogers cars that came in contact with David Bernard from the replay we saw earlier. This is second place, Stephen Richards chasing down a two and a half, three second gap to race leader, Todd Kelly. laps of race one here at Shanghai round five of the V8 Supercar Championship Series. It's Holden one, two and three. Kelly, Richard, Scaife. Then it's the Fords of Marcus Ambrose and Craig Lowndes and Craig Lowndes has arrived on the scene very quickly. Yeah, he's got pretty good consistency at the moment. That car's rocking along pretty well, but he's running out of laps. We're, we're looking at the possibility of yet another race winner officially in the championship at least this year. We know that Todd did well at the Australian Grand Prix meeting in Melbourne. But uh, analysing race wins this year, Murphy's got three, Ambrose three, Lowndes, Scaife, Ingle and Stephen Richards won. Todd Kelly may add his name to that list. He's got a pretty handsome margin at the moment, 2.3 seconds. Last lap for him was a 52-1, Stephen Richards 52 even, Mark Scaife the same. Marcus Ambrose 52-3, Lowndes 51-6. So that uh, underlines what you were saying, Lee, that he's quick at the moment. Not sure that he's going to be able to do too much with it. And then Radisich is sixth. Good effort. 51-9, bright. And then Greg Murphy, Jason Richards, Jamie Wincup. Lowndes was in a very good mood prior to the start of this race. And I asked him, Neil, why the car didn't look so good on its shootout lap. And he feels that they really didn't get the best run at the car on four green tyres in qualifying. Unfortunately, because his own teammate Stephen Ellery went off, it happened while Lowndes was on a lap with four green tyres and it basically killed his chance to, to get a, a look at the car and feel what its performance was like to manage the tyres. All they did was then add two rears at a time for, throughout the rest of qualifying. So when it came to the shootout, they were on four brand new tyres and he didn't feel the balance was as good. They learnt a lot. Remember, in race one at Eastern Creek, it was a jet to begin with in race one. They changed two rear tyres at Eastern Creek and it went away. They've taken that platform and helped uh, hopefully in this race. And look at the rear left of that car, Neil. That's where he got melted by Stephen Johnson. It was such a lucky escape. And now Lowndes is in the hunt for a top five finish. And he's starting to really apply pressure here to Marcus Ambrose. I spoke to him also before the start of the race and he said that when they did go for the four green tyres for the shootout, the car was just simply way too pointy. And the reason he had the big moment through the chicane at four and five was the back of the car just got away from him and it mispositioned the car when he tried to negotiate turn five. And they've calmed it down now for the race and it's pretty effective. 51-7 on the last lap for him and he's the only guy in the leading group that's circulating in 51s. It was a 2-5 for Todd, a 2-3 for Stephen, a 2-3 for Mark, a 2-3 for Marcus, a 2-3 for Radisich, a 2-0 for Jason Bright. So looking at a 51-7 for Lowndes means he's a comfortably uh, the, the quickest guy of this group. If you're superstitious and into numbers, eight is a lucky number here in China and Lowndes feels he's three times as lucky because he has triple eight. We'll see if that plays out. You believe in any of that, mate? <laughs> believe in good balance <laughs> and, and, fast uh, and fast cars. Uh, I reckon we would all reach for a different number if we would have cured some uh, <laughs> slow cars over the years. But that was the easy way to fix it. But, Ambrose uh, is under serious pressure here for the top Ford spot in this race that has been dominated by Holden's. listen there to Craig coming on in the back straight. It's interesting always to listen to the throttle work. This is as much a foot skill, this business, as it is a hand skill. It tells you a lot about the behaviour of the car and the style of the driver. Let's have a look here with Craig. Inside, inside at the hairpin, squeezes through. And Ambrose is unable to switch back. Forceful move, but a clean one. Good one, wasn't it? Very good move. Opportunistic move, he snuck down, ducked out at the very last moment, and he made it stick, didn't block a brake, no contact. Saw the, saw the opening and went for it, that's what you've got to do. And very, very well done. Usually when you have a big last minute lunch like that, it's very easy to lock a brake, or it's pretty easy, obviously, to rub panels. Right at the very end, Marcus saw him, gave him a little bit of space. Here it is again, look at that whack. In fact, he probably outfoxed him a little because the indication from Craig was he was going to go the, the other way. Yeah. Sharp move, very decisive. 
and it's paid off. He now sits fourth. We'll see if Ambrose can respond. What about our race leader, though, Todd Kelly? 2.1 seconds, the lead. And here is the surging Ford for Triple Eight Racing. No better electrical stores, of course, in China. That's why there's a different livery on the side of that car. But the 22 HRT machine is flying. Kelly's best result this year has been fourth in the championship races, that is. Hasn't been on the podium yet. So this will be a great way to celebrate. So he's on target to become the new lap record holder at this track, a 151.07. Last lap, as I said before, 52 for This is Anthony Travis toll entry in the pit lane. Getting some underbonnet surgery at the moment. Mark Scaife could be vulnerable here too if he doesn't get a wriggle on because Lowndes is quick. His split times very quick. Nearly a second faster in this split on this lap. Coming good towards the end of the race. The Triple Eight Falcon. Kelly, Richard, Scaife, Lowndes, Ambrose, Radisic, sixth. Wright is seventh. So he's coming good too. Murphy is slipping. He's sliding down the order. Is he having tyre trouble? They were talking to him before about making a change. Steve Henderson asked, is it worth having a fiddle around with the rear anti-roll bar in the car to get it to behave a bit better? So I'd say his balance has gone away. That's Campbell Little advising Craig Lowndes. Lowndes, position four. Acknowledgement from Lowndes. He's chasing Todd Kelly, Steve Richards, Mark Scaife. Over the line, 52-1 for Kelly, 52-3 for Richards, 2-2 for Scaife. 51-6 for Lowndes, he's on the tear. And what a fabulously successful weekend for this team. Dodo Racing, both of these cars in the top 10. Jason Richards, ninth. Jamie Wincup, 10th. The team that was based in Sydney as a one-car team, moved to Melbourne over the off-season, grew to a two-car team, signed up this young Victorian and Jamie Wincup to accompany the Kiwi. Two great guys, a terrific team with Ron Harrop and Wally Story behind him. Many others, there's Kevin Murphy and they will be thrilled with this. And Lee, he's one of a couple of drivers in this pit lane that haven't been afraid to pick up the spanners this weekend and work on their car with resources and parts at a premium for this first flyaway event for V8 Supercar. Some of the drivers have been chipping in. Jamie Wincup's one, Paul Dumbrell's another. Good result for Wincup at this stage. Murphy just running a little wide onto that Astro turf here with Jason Richards behind. Very slippery if you get out there been a real frustration in that dodo racing camp for the last couple of race minutes with this crazy misfire that they've got neil burns their engine man i'd love to say tearing his hair out but he doesn't, doesn't have any. much of that stuff <laughs> which is what the reason they call him part but uh it, i saw him just before the start of the race and he's, oh, it's been driving them crazy and they've done everything other than basically reconfigure the entire wiring loom in the car I went down there and had a chat to Ron Harrop about that very issue. And he looks around, he says, take a look over there. They're in garage 13. <laughs> Sorry, mate, I'm getting back to the numbers oh, again. Numbers. <laughs> Lowndes is on scape. He's been the quickest in the first two sectors of this go, particular mate. lap. And now he's hounding scape, but he's running out of time. The final two laps. 51.8 for him, that lap. Scaife's uh, lap time is a 52.1. So he pulled back three tenths in the end. Let's stay with him, have a look at it. Oh, Mark Scaife makes a mistake. Lovely. The car uncouples at just the wrong moment when the load was on it. And actually, Craig ran wide in the second part, so that sort of equalised, each of them making pressure errors. Lowndes has got the momentum, though. Will he try an Ambrose-style move up into the hairpin at the end of the long back straight? Picked up the throttle earlier then than Scaife. Oh, this will be contact. Oh, oh, oh. They're rubbing. Oh, they're going to get away with it, are they? Good yeah. clean driving. Well, what I think Craig did in the end then was just get out of the throttle and not force the issue. But it's an unsettling moment for Scaife with the car rattling down the side. And that lets Ambrose back in the game as well. Smart heads up driving from Craig Lowndes to avoid contact when they were that close at that part of the circuit in particular. This is turn nine, then ten. Scaife grabs the brake to steady the car and turns some load to the front tyres. Lowndes looking up the inside because of the wider approach that Mark initially takes. It allows him to be shallower here. Is this Lowndes' opportunity? This is where he got Ambrose. Scaife knows it, though. Sitting in the middle of the road, heading to the right-hand side, the defensive option. Anthony Trapp was the slower car off to the right. Scaife defensive. Richards in the foreground. Good speed across the face of the corner there from Craig Lowndes. The car gets over the kerbing well. Well, over and under here, he'll try to over and under. 
onto the front stretch. Last lap coming up. First race of three. Gets a good run out. He'll try and have a shot at scaping the turn one. Here, hear how early Craig picked the throttle up then. He's just trying to force the car into a position where he just make a tiny positional gain on Mark Skate. That piece has dropped out the front left the side of his air dam. This is where they both made a little error in the previous lap. Initially Mark and then Craig. Ambrose right with him. Lowndes will take a shot at him again. Watch this, he's right with him. This is where he tried the move earlier on the previous lap. We're engrossed in this battle. We should give some credit to the rat, Paul Radisic. He's immediately behind this for Team Kiwi Racing and running in a very solid sixth position. 1.9 seconds Todd Kelly enjoys over Stephen Richards at the moment. This is where the heat is. They're on their way home. The first ever V8 race in Shanghai, China. And it's been a good one. Todd Kelly is on his way to snatching that first win. Lowndes get scathe. Does Ambrose have anything to offer? Time and distance is running out. They're all getting hungrier. They get right over the top of the curbing there, trying to find ways of generating grip, cover the other guy, look for a little advantage. Scafe out in the gutter on the back side of the Vallalunga curbing there, almost running out of road. Lowndes is not close enough. He's not close enough there. Will he over and under like he did Ambrose? He's not close enough. No. Scaife should be able to hold on to this position. And Mark turned in pretty early just to make sure that there was no gap there. I think he's OK. But a terrific pressure race from these guys. It's been a long while for Todd Kelly. Hidden Valley a year ago, more than a year ago. Kelly wins the first ever race in Shanghai. Stephen Richards second. And Scaife hangs on to third. I get some fun. And we all finished. <laughs> Good rear. Pick up on that one. Yes. Subtle message there. Subtle message from Craig Lowndes to the universe. There's Robbie Starr and the HRT gang. A 1-3 result. That will please them. It's a hold at 1-2-3. Stephen Richards for Castrol Perkins in second. Then Lowndes, Ambrose, Radisic, Bright. A solid result in seventh. Richards win Cup and Murphy. Top ten. But it's Todd Kelly's day. Well done, Todd. Very impressive performance. Credit to the pit crew as well, who serviced him in very, very slick style. Popped him out right behind Stephen Richards, and then he forced the issue with Richards in turn one, forced his way through, and drove away to victory. That will take some of the heat off him, some of the pressure. As we take a look at our VB scoreboard, we know who the podium men are, and then Ford, fourth and fifth with Lowndes, and Ambrose, you have to give a huge pat on the back to the Dodo boys, Jason Richards, Jamie Wincup. That will bring a huge Shanghai smile to their faces. Valuable race as we roll through the remainder of the results. Credit to Glenn Seat. He started 21st, so to finish 14th, we'll give him a little bit of a lift. And Russell Ingalls did it tough, 13th, for the man who was second in the championship. Let's get to Greg. Well, some big cheers went up amongst the Holden Racing team here on pit wall. First and third, Rob Star, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, fantastic result for the team. Obviously, to have both cars up there on the first first go here is fantastic. You know, great job by Todd. He, he drove flawless, and you know, Schofield was obviously having a few battles there, but he managed to bring it home. So, you know, we're real proud of him. Just tell me very quickly, how much was Mark's car hurting with the damage towards the end there? He did a terrific job to fend off Craig Lowndes. Yeah, I don't think it was the best car to drive, and obviously Lowndes' thing was pretty good, so it's, uh, you know, Scafie's a hard man to get past, so. Good on you. Go and enjoy, Rob. Thanks, mate. Daryl? Well, Roland Dane, that goes to show you how important the top ten shootout is for Craig, because in the race that car had good speed. Yeah, I mean, we were far and away the quickest car out there. If you look at the, uh, the consistency, the car was fantastic. Um, we, we missed out on pole really through uh, one little uh, setup problem probably on the car, it caused us a problem in one corner, otherwise I think Craig would have been on pole and we wouldn't have had to work as hard as we did today. i tell you what, you've got a pretty talented boy behind that wheel though, he's great to watch in a battle. That was uh, one of the passes of the season wasn't it? Yeah, great. Thanks Roll. Okay, thank you. It was, it was a fade to the outside and then it was a very fast and decisive dive to the inside to grab that position. There is Lowndes' 888 machine. And fourth place will give him 
valuable championship points. And he was Ford's top man. Big thumbs up from Lowndes. He's pleased with that. But Todd Kelly has started the weekend in the best possible way for the Holden Racing Team. Race one down, two more to come. sights of Shanghai that have captured the attention of the V8 supercar drivers is the unusual yet impressive Oriental Pearl TV Tower. It's 468 metres high, making it the world's third tallest TV and radio tower. On a clear day, visitors can literally see for miles. The ultra-modern tower combines ancient concepts such as the spherical pearls, which Shanghai is known for, its state-of-the-art technology. Holden has dominated at this circuit throughout the weekend and race one was no different. They got the hat trick. Time now to hear from our top three. Well, Mark Scaife, that was a fascinating battle to watch at the end of that race. What was the car like? Yeah, actually, it, uh, it uh, lost some rear grip, Rusty, um, and it uh, was struggling towards the end there. But, you know, I mean, it was a good battle with the lounge. It was very fair and uh, he was up the inside. We had a couple of little bumps and stuff. I mean, you know, that's, that's the sort of racing that people pay their money to see or sit in their lounge rooms to watch and uh, you know that's that's what we that's what we're here for third place is a terrific way to start the weekend but fantastic for the team a one three well i mean let's let's be realistic first uh, time in shanghai you know to be pole position and then to win the first race and run third as two cars on the podium uh, you know fantastic for hrt and uh, it shows that we're on the way back rusty mark sky congratulations that's right richo i guess you always like to get that first race out of the way out of the three good result yeah good result you know we um, work pretty hard to try and make it a good race car, and it was a very good race car. Struggled a little bit early on with a with a fuller fuel, so be some uh, needs of adjustment tonight. What about as far as tyres go? Everyone was worried about the left rear. No, nah, no problem. No. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. Todd Kelly, first ever race winner in Shanghai, China, in a V8 supercar. What's that feel like? Well, I tell you what, it's pretty special. It was. Uh a little bit of a tough race early on. I uh, pushed quite hard on the tyres, but then there were times towards the end where I could uh, back off on it. But just to go down that straight on the last lap, and you're so focused, you don't look. But on the last lap, I looked up and just saw the surroundings, and uh, it's fantastic. Hopefully, we can keep that up through the weekend. When you and I spoke prior to the race, you were a little unhappy with yourself over your performance in the shootout. Did you change the car for the race? We did a little bit. I, I just did a really bad job in the shootout. I lost a lot of time in turn one and at the hairpin. And I knew the car was uh, a lot better than what the time suggested, but uh, it's going to be tough. I was lucky to get a little bit of a break there early on, but uh, if I was back with Richo and Scaife, it would have been a pretty tough race. Final one and a quick one. What was the car like on its tyres? Is it kind to its tyres? Well, it wasn't too bad, but like I said, I was fortunate enough there once I got a gap to, uh, to look after them pretty well, but uh, I reckon the guys behind would have been doing a lot harder than I was. Congratulations, Todd. Thank you. Race one gave us plenty of positives to talk about, but there was one serious incident involving Mark Winterbottom's car. Neil Crompton has more. This incident involving Mark Winterbottom and the Orcon Ford in race one was something of a puzzle for us, but we've unravelled the mystery. That metal grate that attacked the car dramatically damaged the front air dam and splitter, attacked the base of the radiator and all the cross member front anti-roll bar and all the mechanisms beneath the front of the car. But it's only when you go inside the cockpit of the Orcon Ford that you realise what a lucky escape this young fella had. Driver's seat, this is where the crutch straps come through. It's bashed the base of the seat, including back here, missing his backside by millimetres, but look inside the cabin. It has ripped a gaping hole through the floor, literally stopping the car in its tracks. It's chopped through the roll cage. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's also damaged the diff housing. Unfortunately for Mark Larkham and his team, they're facing a massive list of bits that they need to remanufacture before they get to the Darwin round of the championship. This is going to be a very expensive shunt. And this thing down here is the offending item. It's that heavy you can barely pick it up. If there is any good news to this story, it's that circuit engineers have been out overnight and rectified the problem that won't happen again. Certainly was a very lucky escape for Orcon Racing's Mark Winterbottom. Now reminding you not to miss your latest issue of Australian Muscle Car Magazine. It is in newsagents right now and it features the 25 greatest Australian muscle competition muscle cars of all time. Plus there's the amazing captain Peter Jansen, the valiant pacer, drag racing and speedway greats, handy tech, tech tips and a whole lot more. Australian Muscle Car Magazine, get it? It's on sale right now.
Now, our Daryl Beattie has been many things in life, a 500cc Grand Prix race winner, a helicopter pilot, but this week he became a tour guide for a group of drivers. He took them downtown, not to the traditional downtown, though, of high-rises and shops. He went to Old Town to take a look, a closer look, at the more traditional Chinese way of life. We're staying in an area about 30 minutes from here in a pretty nice hotel. We've come down to the old district of Shanghai. I think the culture and what we can see here already before we get into these streets is going to have plenty on offer, so let's go and have a look. Watch it, check it out. How many people are living in, in this area? Uh, I guess in this district you'd have a couple of million. Yeah. Hey, dude. Curry, you look good at this, man. Hey, you're the one that wins. Hey, you're, 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 you're the winning dress. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's not your colour, is it? It's white. Pure white. It's your colour. It's your white for you. Yeah. I'll take the whole basket. Chamber cream. This is all the money. 100 US dollars for the whole. 100 US dollars. I probably wanted 100 US at the end of 90. I reckon we can get them down to 60. 60 US would be worth it. That's it. Exactly. Little sir. If you take anything to throw eggs at Russell. Yeah. Is this probably the most difficult? Oh, absolutely. Easily. I mean, done a lot of, been to Europe and done a lot of the touristy stuff over there and seen a lot of that. And, uh, now coming here and seeing China is just completely different to anything you've ever seen or experienced. I've got a new idea. Oh, 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 oh. New bonnet scoop for Falcon. Yeah? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Much air. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Can you imagine people like this seeing V8 supercars walking out of here and going to Shanghai on the weekend? Mate, I reckon they'll be a bit confused after a while, but then again, there's uh, there's a fair few different people in V8 supercars, so they might blend in pretty well. <laughs> Multi-talented now, Darrell, isn't he? Now, the V8 Muscle Car Mania competition has been very popular this year, and Greg Murphy, on behalf of Super Cheap Auto, congratulates John Lippiot from Acacia Ridge in Queensland on winning round two of the V8 Muscle Car Mania competition. Greg was there to present John with the keys to his brand new SV8 Commodore and $5,000 worth of Super Cheap Auto vouchers. And if you want to be a winner, get into your local Super Cheap Auto store and enter. Good luck. Now, he cops quite a bit of grief from us here on the Network 10 commentary team. We often tell Greg Rust he needs to take anger management lessons. But he needed to let off a little bit of steam this week, so he took Mark Winterbottom and Max Wilson along with him for a lesson in Kung Fu at the ultimate martial arts experience. Have you done anything like this before? Nothing at all. Bit of boxing? Not much at all. A little bit of jiu jitsu, a little bit of in Brazil. That's it, it's not much like Kung Fu, but have fun. Follow his lead, I reckon. Yeah. So there we were, in an old abandoned Chinese theatre, an entirely appropriate location for a trio of Bruce Lee wannabes. Among the many forms of martial arts practised at the Longwu International School is Wushu, the Chinese style of Kung Fu. Its origins date back well over a thousand years, and it's just one of many derivatives of this ancient art. 
Oh, my legs are killing. Make pain your friend, they said. Under the guidance of Alvin Yeo, Shanghai's Wushu team captain, we had a thorough two-hour training session. Everybody was on full fire. Alvin is only 27 years old and has been studying Wushu since he was four. Much of the choreography in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is inspired by this style of Kung Fu. You're swearing a fair bit. Bloody hard work. <laughs> Coordination's the thing that's got me, but you're going pretty well with it. <laughs> Try to. It's pretty hard. It's pretty different, actually. But uh, to be honest, that's pretty much the routine that I do, I do before I get into the car all the time. <laughs> yeah, note to self, no more impersonations of Max in pit lane. The pint-sized Brazilian has a powerful kick. And after training recently with WBF super middleweight champ Shannon Taylor, Winterbottom can throw a decent punch. Still working on that kick, though. We learned the basic kicks and punching techniques along with blocking skills and even pieced together a pattern or form as they call it in this beautiful fluid style of martial art. Look the pop, look the pop, flat. How did you find that? Too much to memorize. Too much to memorize? Too much to memorize the racetrack, memorize all the movements here. What do you think, Mark, Mark Lee? Yeah, yeah, Mark, Mark Lee. Lee. Yeah. Maxie, no. Yeah, she's good, good for the hand eye coordination. How, how did Mark go, the tall? How did he go? Uh, he looks so-so. Uh, so-so? Yeah. <laughs> he's uh, stiff, you know. What about Max? He looks very strong. He's, he's good at kicking or... Yes. There is life after motor racing, and for a brief moment in time, well, in our minds actually, Shanghai had discovered its next big martial arts movie yeah. stars. Right. Who needs Chuck Norris and Steven Seagal? So, Bad Max, we meet again. You lost the last race, you will not win this fight. So, thought you could out with me, huh? I see your dress sense has not improved. Now, the one thing we have learned out of this class tonight, you know what that is, Mark? I'm going to ask you, mate, what is it? No more short jokes about <laughs> Max Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very pleased to tell you that Greg is a lot more relaxed now. Now, at any good V8 race meeting, you've got a balanced crowd. You've got Ford and Holden supporters. But the Red Army seem to be back here in Shanghai. We'll see if they can get another right result on the other side of this break. Coming up, we send Greg Russ up the river as he takes us on a tour of the Bun. Steve Richards and I head down to a local tea house for some interesting cuisine and a candid chat about life in a motor racing family. Next, we're back on track for race two. This is the V8 Supercars from Shanghai, China. ...unfold and turn into the little mess that we've just seen. But on successive laps, both the HRT cars have totally uncoupled from the road through the fast chicane at four and five. On the previous lap, it was Mark Schaefer had a moment and he was vulnerable again to Todd Kelly. On this most recent lap, Todd Kelly got way out of shape there a minute ago in the rear of the car. And uh, Marcus is now sweating. He's almost gone. Well, it did go straight ahead. The window what? is now open. They had, it and they had actually called him in. And I think he just forgot for a moment and was going to have a lunge at Todd and realised he was due to come in. Race leader's in, fourth place man is in. Yeah, I just stopped with the rear of the car. The three bar down, I got a lot of push. I can't get the front bar back, it's locked. But I think we're going to struggle with the rear. Not as much as you did uh, the first time on my second practice front mate. Probably about half of that. Yeah, OK, Mark. Just turn the pit light off for us. Escape's gone quicker again, 51 5, double three, five. Fastest lap of the race. Marcus in. Going left side. You heard Marcus Ambrose say to Paul Forgy, I think we're going to struggle with rears. We'll find out. Eight laps longer today. Good stop from Stone Brothers. They serviced that car very efficiently. Marcus had it leaping by the time it was coming down off the jacks, and away he went change the working side tyres that's down the left hand side of the car for this longer race too. So they exit as they ended. Richards ahead of Ambrose. 
the weekend started so strongly for the super cheap auto team and particularly for you greg murphy what what happened there in that uh, in that concertina go jack on the front Listen uh, to me, well, yeah typical typical concertina at the hairpin and you know uh I'm still sort of doing everything okay and I got tagged from behind as I turned in so someone's gone in way too deep or whatever I'm not sure and turned us around and so we were last got going and got a bad run onto uh, the front straight and stuffed up went too deep into turn one and I was very narrow trying to sort of hold off a couple of blokes and it was uh, too too narrow and uh, that was the end of that. I couldn't couldn't stop the car, couldn't turn it, and we hit for the gravel. We've just seen the replay now. You got some big air then. It felt like it in the car. Don't worry about that. But you know, it's just a disaster, actually. Hard luck, Rick. Thanks. That was Dukes of Hazard style. Pretty wild. Seventh in the championship going into this race. 552 points. We expected strong results from Greg here this weekend. He started out very strongly in day one of practice. General consensus was that his driving style and the way he's been working with that car would work pretty well here. Here's Garth Tander, been in the woes, tangled up in the drama down at the hairpin in those opening couple of laps through no fault of his own. Damage to the front and rear of that car, but it hasn't stopped it, fortunately, so he'll still score points, but he's down in 25th place. Look at this, That's pressure behind. on, Neil, pressure on. Here comes Richard, Scape's been released. They'll stay as is, but Richards is up at race pace. Is he close enough now to mount a challenge to Scafi? Mark's going to have to be super careful here with these cold tyres. Not sure whether they did working side or rears. Definitely goes to show how tough it is for someone like Murphy, who started third yesterday in race one to finish 10. He had fuel pressure issues in that car and dropped through the field. So it's tough in this category when you get it back amongst the eight and 10th position and you've got to battle. Yeah, when you're further down the order, as you know, Daryl, it just becomes hard work. Even if you have a little speed advantage, you're not able to use it. And that's one of the difficulties, particularly with the complex in the middle of this circuit where there's a fair bit of follow the leader. All of that mess in the opening couple of laps has benefited three drivers in particular. Seaton, Wheel and McConville, they have been the big winners out of everybody spinning and dropping off the track. We will keep an eye on those three. Scaife, Richards, Ambrose going together here. Todd Kelly has stayed out. He is leading the race at the moment over Radisic. Good job, mate. Good job. All of the top guys and leading teams now do such a great job of dealing with cold tyres and hustling the car in awkward circumstances. Whenever you've got two cold tyres on a car and two warm tyres that are a real handful to drive. Todd Kelly in for his service. You may have seen in the background Paul Radisic for Team Kiwi Racing. He also came in. Here is the HRT gang. They did a beautiful job with Todd Kelly yesterday and they've done it again. Nice work, Greg. 3.5 seconds, Lee. A time that matches that of Russell Ingle, who stopped just moments ago. But the contrast here is they changed rear tyres on the Ingle car. They've changed the passenger side on both Todd Kelly. And I can also tell you they took the same approach on Mark Scaife's car. Everyone's treating this concrete down here a little more cautiously today, trying to make sure they pull up on the line. Well, quite a number of them overshot in the pit stop for race one. Very easy to do. Saw a couple of people on the first day of practice when there was a bit of water around coming to garages on the painted surface and they just about went out through the back of the garage. But uh, even at 40 k's when you're on the limiter and you think this is walking pace in the car, it's uh, still pretty hairy. You've got to be very careful in the pit lane. Those laps while Todd Kelly was out in front by himself may not have been as productive as they could have been because he's come out behind Marcus Ambrose. Ambrose didn't need to pass him on the track. He did it in pit lane. So that was easy work for the Pertec Ford. Todd will just be resetting the anti-roll bars in the car, having a think about brake bias. Long run now from here on this half set of tyres that he's just taken on. Need to try and keep the car hustled along, but at the same time not use up anything too much. It'd be very easy to abuse the left rear tyre on this circuit or overused the brakes and uh, at the end of this big long straight that Paul Radisich is on at the moment, big hot stop here, stopping from just inside the 200 board. Uh, if that's not bad enough, when you do the U-turn and come back out at 12.13 and head up to the last turn, 14, it's another pretty big brake application there and it's that second application that some drivers have been complaining about. Paul was talking about this 
after race one that it's this next stop that he's approaching where you get a little bit of what's described as knockoff where front brakes are roaring hot the pads settle back in the caliper and when you apply the brake pedal you get too much rear brake so the back of the car wants to jump out this is on board with mark scape terrific shot let's have a bit of a look and listen turn one we're just coming into the second part of it second gear turn two Safety tap to make sure there's pedal pressure. Lock the brake there. Overshot. We were with him when he actually locked it, then he's now told them that he's got a little mark on the left-hand front tyre. Comfortable margin over Stephen Richards, though, isn't it? And now Kelly has caught Ambrose somewhat. We'll keep an eye on that. Jason Bright is leading this race at the moment. Here's the Zinger replay. And the reason I knew it was I could see the steering wheel snatch in Mark's hands and you could see the way he was pumping the brake pedal trying to get that front wheel turning again. It becomes a manual form of ABS, if you like, to make sure that the wheel rotates. If it stops, it puts a big flat spot or mark on the tyre. And uh, that's the sort of thing that can damage you pretty quickly in a race. It's done so easily. He might have only braked could have been something on the surface of the road or he might have braked half a car length or a metre or two later and whack the damage. That's Jason Barguana. He's been on the radio complaining. He said the engine just shut down on him. No wonder Todd Kelly's catching Marcus Ambrose. New lap record. Here it is. 151.05 for Todd Kelly. And turns up the heat on Marcus Ambrose. Still not yet halfway distance in this race. And the pit window will stay open for another 10 laps. Closes at 21. Wright, Wills, Ritter, Baird, McConville, Andrew Jones. The top six cars on the racetrack haven't stopped. Kelly switches line. He's got on the inside of Ambrose, side by side, door to door. And Kelly, the quick man on the track, gets through. it was in race one it is in race two that is Holden 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 different order though it's Scape Richards and Todd Kelly and an update on his younger brother Rick who's had a pretty troublesome weekend it seems to be turning around he's come from 30th to 17th so some progress for the team Buick driver going back to your question Lee about what, what does it feel like when you're flat shifting in the car little mechanism that just aids the drivers in this process it's called a shift cut and it just momentarily interrupts the electrical or spark supply of the engine for just fractions of a second thousands of a second and it enables the load to come off the gearbox for the driver to be able to make the shift through the pattern and it just releases the load sufficiently so that you can whip the chains through and of course the, the real effect of that is that oh David Bernard's pointing the wrong way there in the right pattern Shakespeare Ford uh, the net effect of that is that the rear wheels drive for longer. So if you imagine you're boring down the back straight here, you're making the change from fifth to sixth. By the time you cycle the clutch pedal and lift on and off the throttle pedal, that effectively stops the rear wheels driving for some number of metres. It might be 10 or 15 or 20 metres. With flat shifting, it does still interrupt the drive, but for a very small period of time, it might only interrupt drive for a couple of metres in the back of the car. 
getting back to the diversity of results in this championship and the variety of winners which has been wonderful in season 2005 it reminds me a lot of the beginning of the AFL or rugby league season winners were so difficult to predict and it's been that case in the V8 Supercar Championship this year Zinger replay Looks like David just got into the grey on the outside of the corner. The track is beginning to rubber up quite nicely now in this second race. You can see a distinct black line there and it looked like David just got a little bit wide, got one or two wheels out and the grey verge where there's no grip and he turned the WPS forward around. I don't think there'll be any great damage done but he'll have dropped some spots. He's down the order at the moment. at race one distance. It was 22 laps for the opening one this weekend. All escape locked up there. Going into the final turn, there was a little puff of smoke. He'll have to be very careful with this because the tendency... Oh, it's not really gaining much now. It's about the same. That's Stephen Richards. The tendency will be for that flat spot to want to keep on getting worse. You have to be very careful in the way he applies the pedal. 52-7 for Skay, 52-6 for Richards, 2-6 for Kelly, 3-1 for Ambrose, 3 even for Paul Radisich, 2-4 for Russell Ingall, so he's the quickest guy, 2-5 for Glenn Seaton, quickest of the top 10 cars, so watch out for Ingall and Seaton, remember I said that early, just that it'll be the latter stage, is the last 10 laps of this race that I think will be fascinating, and the fellas that uh, have got a good balance in their car and look after their tyres will have a sharp arrow at the end. Look at the rat. He's closing in on Ambrose. Very pleased with this car, this team. Very comfortable. Some frustration, as I mentioned earlier, with the straight line speed or lack thereof. But they've got a bit of a smile on their face down in that camp. They think they might have the updated Alan Draper engines, maybe even as soon as Hidden Valley. They may have one. Garth Tander getting out of shape down at turn 12 and runs off over the edge of the Astro turf. No great damage done there, but uh, drops spots. Look at Kelly tucked in right in behind Stephen Richards, trying to maximise everything, trying to get any advantage. But he can't quite creep any closer, and Scape is doing it comfortably behind these guys. After Radisic, it's Ingle, Seat, McConville, and Jamie Wincup in the top 10. Ritter and Ford Performance Racing are playing right to the very edge of the pit window. He's still officially the leader of the race but hasn't done his compulsory stop for tyres and that uh, opportunity will close out for him in the next lap. So they were obviously hoping for a safety car or something to help them gamble their way up the order which is, a, which is often one of those games that you can play if you've had a tough weekend and you need to play a little ball or nothing but today he's going to get nothing from that strategy. That's exactly what happened with uh, the Surame Commodore driver Paul Morris yesterday. He said, he said, at the end of the day, what happened? He said, we were just rolling the dice, hoping for a safety car. Staying out, but it didn't come. All things considered, brand new track and lots of little trip wires in this place and gravel to go and find yourself playing in. There's actually been very few in the way of major incidents. Uh, really, no safety car intervention and no great dramas. The damage on the front of the car and the skirmish that he got caught up in was costly for Jason Bright, who was a top 10 runner in race one. He is way down the order in the 20s. This is a very productive weekend for the man we're riding on board with, Stephen Richards. Third in the championship, closing in significantly on Russell Ingall. Finished ahead of the two guys, ahead of him in the championship in race one, and he's ahead of both of them now. So a nice weekend so far for the Castrol man. Team boss Larry Perkins didn't come up to China this weekend. Castrol team boys were very happy yesterday because crucially Stephen finished in front of his key rivals in the championship but also that the car was strong in the latter part of the race so perhaps we're seeing that form continue on. The track temperature for this race started out at 38 degrees. It has risen to 40. A lot of the data in relation to cabin temperature doesn't get fed back live, but the teams will monitor it between races. At the conclusion of yesterday's race, most of the cabin temperatures we were getting were 51 degrees. And you can only expect that it's even hotter than that today. One guy yesterday, Greg, that was trying to fix that problem with cabin temperature, and it was a surprise with Stephen Richards. He said to me last night, he said, it's the first time ever I ran a cool suit yesterday. He said, boy, didn't it help? I love it. And today being hotter, we'll be enjoying that.
they make an enormous difference and uh, some of them are equipped with like a skull cap and have little capillaries of ice water running through them and it's uh, oh, if you turn the switch on it's amazing it just uh, completely transforms you heat is the big enemy in the cars and the hotter you are the more it, uh, when your adrenaline's pumping it excites your heart rate it's kind of a it's a diminishing drama you just the, you know you just end up in a situation where you uh, get hot you can't concentrate you get hotter your heart beats faster and it keeps on getting worse so a lot of them now putting a lot more time and effort and thought into how to channel cool air into the car or run the cool suits and no good having the very latest in race car technology that finds you a tenth of a second if the guy's that hot that he can barely do the job and loses seconds huffing and puffing. Speaking of temperatures yesterday, Neil, it was also interesting, a few of them after the race were saying that they had sore eyes and they thought that the fuel blend or something about the fuel here was different and Marcus was one of those, so that was interesting. Fastest fellow on the racetrack in the last lap or so, just looking down the computer order, was Jamie Wincup. He did a 52-1 on the last lap, and he's still in contention here. He's 10th, a lot of laps still to come. On lap 21 now, and Greg Ritter will need to come in and perform his compulsory pit stop. You're looking at Buick's Rick Kelly running in 17th at the moment, 16th realistically once Ritter performs his stop. He's being hounded by Brad Jones. Getting back to that cool suit conversation, Neil, uh, I guess the other side of the coin is when they fail. They can't steam you like a dim sim, can they? One failed on me in Darwin, of all places, oh, oh, no. a few years ago. And uh, you can imagine some of the chat on the radio. So Ritter has now come in. We're in our correct order. It's Scaife, Richards, Todd Kelly, Marcus Ambrose, Paul Radisic, the top five. Then Ingle, Seaton. And Ingle's within a shot of Glenn Seaton, incidentally. And then McConville, Wincup, and Paul Wheel. That's the top ten. Greg Ritter, incidentally, has now peeled off and uh, taken that stop. So that corrects the order in the field. Scaife, Richards, Kelly, Ambrose, Radisic, Ingle, Seaton, McConville, Wincup, and Nine Paul to go. Wheel. Nine left to go. And the charges of the gang at the moment, the fastest bloke in the top ten is, well, it's jointly shared between Marcus Ambrose and Jamie Wincup, in fact, and Stephen Richards. They've all done 52 fives on this lap. Andrew Jones in the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. And this, I'd have to say, is a solid run for Andrew. He's certainly been caught up in a lot of trouble in season 2005, but to be in the top 20 is a solid performance. His teammate, on the other hand, is in the top 10. And McConville, who had dreadful rear tyre trouble yesterday, barely made it to this distance to lap 22, is looking strong now. They were tucking into their pet late last night at about 10.30, and I said, gee, it's a bit late for, for dinner, you blokes. And they were moaning and groaning because they'd been out PRing into the evening <laughs> and uh, working uh, their commercial duties. And uh, they were a bit frustrated by their car performance during the day. But like everybody in this field, they've done a lot of work to try and correct the performance of the cars. Just wandered up to the pit wall and had a word to Gary Rogers and Cameron McConville's engineer, Phil Curtis. Phil says, they're going okay at the moment. Yesterday, with about eight or ten laps to go, Cameron lost the, the strength and the feeling in the rear tyres. He felt that the car would really fall over on itself in those closing radius corners. They've changed the setup for this race and it's made a big improvement, but crucially, says Phil, we've saved a good set of tyres for the final race. There's no worries about Cameron McConville making the distance. He's super fit. In fact, he's going to ride a bicycle from Melbourne to Mount Panorama, hoping to raise $40,000 for a yet-to-be-named charity, it's called Ride to the Mountain. We wish he and Andrew Jones well with that. Ride with the race leader, Mark Scaife. He enjoys a handy two-and-a-half-second gap over Stephen Richards. Todd Kelly remains in third. Final six laps of this race. And Scaife has a quick look in the mirror. When you do that, you, you have references in your mind for what it looked like last time, and you can always tell whether or not the guy has made a little bit of an impression or not, or whether you're easing away. And obviously, the, it's very comforting when you see that, that the target behind whatever it may be is getting smaller. <laughs> when it gets a bit bigger, it, it tends to put a bit of spring in your step, and you've got to be careful that you don't change your rhythm too much and then start to make mistakes. One of the unique challenges of running the race meeting here from the point of view of the officials in race control, and uh, 
this event is largely staffed in terms of senior personnel by the regular officials from Australia, from uh, the Australian V8 Supercar Company and CAMS with Tim Schenken, the race director, and Peter Wallerman, Colin Bond. But in race control, in the very building that we're in at the moment, the, there are no windows. So everything that they review or look at is done on closed circuit cameras on each of the corners together with the Network 10 coverage. Just uh, stop for a moment and think about how difficult that would be where traditionally race control are able to see most of the things that are going on. But so far this weekend, they've had a very quiet time, which has been good for them. On top of that, the language barrier as well communicating with the Chinese, the corner workers, the marshals. It has been somewhat of a challenging weekend, but so far, so good. Daz? David Bernard, obviously not being a real good day. You've been in the wars. No, not at all. Um, got a reasonable start, racing around, keeping out of trouble, and the split had eliminated. So I came in, swapped that over. The boys did a good job changing that. Going back out, just cruising around, saving tyres, seeing how the car is, and um, I think the engine's let go in a pretty big way, so goes from bad to worse. A few people have had split problems. Is that because drivers are clipping those tyres, or is it a different issue? I don't think so. I think it's more the speed we're doing and, and the length of time we're doing it for, although it doesn't happen at Bathurst, but we, I did one in practice as well, so we can't really put our finger on it, but you just get a big vibration, and eventually it just breaks the bottom off the splitter. I hope it's better for race three. What do you do? Update for David Bernard. You look at Marcus Ambrose. Ambrose maintains his fourth place. He's about half a second shy of the pace that he needs, though, at the moment. And he's maintaining his fourth place, but he's just not in touch with the Missy Schaefer. 2-6, Richards 2-6, Kelly 2-5. 53-1 it is for Ambrose. 53-7 for Radisich. 3-5 for Russell Ingle. Still 2-5 for Glenn Seaton, so uh, he's very quick in this late stage. There were some frayed tempers too within the Stone Brothers camp after qualifying yesterday. There was an incident out on track where was a couple of incidents, we understand, between Marcus Ambrose and Russell Ingle, and Ingle was not at all happy, and we believe that the two had a, uh, a discussion. Nothing more, nothing less, but... Uh, Ingle was not pleased. It's all hands on deck down at the Super Cheap Auto garage on Greg Murphy's car. They are doing a full engine change here. Murphy's even got the hands a, a little bit dirty. They have the old engine out. They're getting the new one ready to go in. Steve Henderson at the front of the car. Greg Murphy's engineer now. As Lee mentioned in our commentary in race one, they have decided this team to, for now at least, stick with the older 18 degree engine. They were going to upgrade to the new Holden Motorsport spec engine, but with the time be between Eastern Creek and here at uh, at China, it was just a little too tight to complete the transformation. David is working our, our cameraman at the back of the car there now, and what you can see is that they have changed also the fuel tank in that car. A lot of undercarriage damage after that big launch through the gravel trap. Yeah, I reckon there'd be a lot of repair work under that car. That was a huge impact it made across that little in, uh, in road, what do you call it? The, the access road access there, road. and he just flew through the air on the other side. Final four laps, and at the moment, with Scaife leading Richard second and Kelly third, those three guys are tied on points for the round. 124 each. Four laps to go, mate. Four laps. You're making good progress. Barry Hay talking to Russell Ingle. Ingle is sixth at the moment. And he's got this man here, Glenn Seaton, chasing him down. Seaton was closer than where he's at now, so whether his car is dropping off or Ingalls is getting stronger in the latter stages of this race. They both did almost identical lap times on the last lap, a 152.65 for Russell, a 152.69 for Glenn, so he's only four one hundred slower. Marcus is the one that's just a little slower. Marcus and Paul Radisich are the, the two slower guys of the leading bunch at the moment. They're in the 53s. When you look at uh, when you look at the, the scope and the history of Australian motorsport, Neil, there's two significant guys here, well, three significant guys in Tim Schenk and Colin Bond and Dick Johnson. To be here in Shanghai watching V8 supercars race, they would never have believed that their category could make it to this level. No, it's very good, isn't it? I said uh, last weekend on RPM when I came back from Avalon where I saw the second group of cars loaded on the 747 down there that. Uh, this is a special moment for the history of Australian motorsport to take our premier category overseas, somewhere special, somewhere different. And uh, 
certainly made a, an impact. I think most people would be genuinely and pleasantly surprised by the level of interest here in the crowd. A lot of media interest was surprised at how many visiting members we have from the Asia Pacific region and the motorsport in general media. So that's been a great exercise so far. Logistically a very tough exercise for everybody involved, for the teams, for Abesco, for Network 10. Just a massive amount of work. All the simple little things that you just become very accustomed to working with uh, back at home are not at your fingertips here. So the whole thing's got to be planned down to literally the last nut and bolt. And the next big part of the exercise is to load all these cars up and get them back because we've got another big away game in Darwin, which is not exactly around the corner for our next round. But I think we've all got to speak volumes for the amount of hard work planning and the beautiful execution uh, by Gibson Freight. Uh, Bill Gibson and his team, his sons and his group, just done a fantastic job. And I don't think I've found anybody in the pit lane yet who hasn't just sung their praise for the outstanding job that they did in pulling together the equipment um, and just the just organisational skills of being able to shift all this gear over here. Two and a half thousand kilos per team in those big containers. The cars on the pellets. Loaded up into 747. That was all done so quickly and efficiently. Where's Seek at the moment? Still a 52-5 for him this lap. 53-1 for Russell Ingle. So Glenn's just marching on. This is one of his real strengths. He is a very, very consistent driver. Very smooth. Doesn't oversteer or slide the car. And that's one of the reasons why in the last two years they've been so strong at Bathurst. He and Craig were a combo. Good. Yeah. Morris and Baird here. We just saw some shots of Greg Ritter. This will be his best result of the 05 season. He's 10th at the moment, so staying out did prove a wise decision for the Ford Performance Racing man. He's slotted in behind Cam McConville, ahead of Wheel. You look at Baird at the moment, and Morris, this is the fight for 19th place. And Bright back in 21st. So a reversal there for the FPR team to see Bright down, Ritter up. That will bring some relief. Ritter was in the wars yesterday, ended up finishing 23rd. Was turned around, was tangling with people. But a good recovery in the second race. We're almost there too. Final two not laps. Not for position, mate. Ellery is not for position. Let Ellery pass, Jake. Paul Morris. <laughs> right responding there, saying Paul Morris is for position, and I'm going to get him right now if I can up the inside into the hairpin. Not letting someone by when I can get by someone, and he does. Hold up, mate. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Key just uh, in consultation there with Jason. It all sounds pretty free and easy sitting here in the comfort of uh, your television, and, uh, but when you're in the race car and you're busy uh, and a voice jumps into the middle of your head, can sometimes be very off-putting. Most of the crew chiefs or engineers try and talk to the drivers when they're just working in a straight line rather than under brakes or in the turns, but it doesn't always work out that way. Well, despite flat spotting that front left ever so slightly, hasn't hindered the progress of Mark Scaife. The lead is now three seconds. He's at the hairpin, he's on his way to get notification of the final lap coming up. He had a win at Barbagallo in race one. That put a big smile on his face. And then, of course, we know about the incident between he and Ambrose in race two. Josh, the leader, entering the last lap now. Last lap, mate, last lap. This will return the smile to the five-time champion, Mark Scaife. One more lap to go, 4.6 kilometres, and he'll be there. wincing when he realised that he put a mark on that tyre. Didn't you say there was some radio communication they were even well, contemplated bringing him, bringing him in? Rob Starr said to him, if it's risky, don't risk it, you know, bring the car in. And they had a little chat about it, but uh, obviously, unless you feel that it's a horror story, if you come in, then it is all over. So you want to try and stay out if you can. And Mark's been around long enough to make a very accurate assessment as to whether or not it's shaking too much and whether it could be down to the canvas, but obviously it wasn't. We ride with Stephen Richards. He will gather more valuable championship points and edge closer to Russell Ingle and Marcus Ambrose. 
That's been a great battle between Stephen Richards and Todd Kelly. Neither of them have relented. Look how close they are even after 30 odd laps of racing. There will be some tired drivers after this. They'll be fatigued somewhat. And the diminutive Kiwi's done well again. For Team Kiwi Racing, Radisic will bag a top five on the back of his solid result yesterday. Final run into this 1.4K back straight. Foot to the floor. Escapes already at the hairpin. Two more turns to go, and he'll grab his win. And this helps Mark Scaife tremendously in the championship, considering he is battling Craig Lowndes. He's fifth at the moment. Lowndes DNF'd in this race. Scaife oh, takes boy. race two at Shanghai. Kelly drew very close to Stephen Richards. Very close at the end, but Richo got second. Here, Kelly. Work on it the next one. And there's Paul Forge congratulating Marcus Ambrose on the radio, saying, well done, we got more points, fourth place is good. There is the official Red Army, but I can tell you there is a huge Red Army of HRT fans here in Shanghai that have made the trip up from Australia bumping into them in the pit lane and around the place. They said, wow, right result yesterday for us. So they will be delighted with that. So too this man, Stephen Richards. Very solid performance. And Ford's top finisher, Marcus Ambrose, fourth. His teammate, Russell Ingle, sixth. So the Stone Brothers pair, still the top performing Ford drivers in this one. And a pleasing result for Dodo Racing's Jamie Wincup. First time ever that he's had two top 10 results in a championship round. Sets up a ripper race three, doesn't it? With three guys tied, 124 points apiece. There's the unofficial, Scaife Richards, just over two seconds when they got to the line, Todd Kelly. So Holden, one, two and three, Marcus Ambrose, four. Great job, Paul Radisich, as you mentioned, Lee. Then Russell Ingle and Glenn Seaton, very quick towards the end, both of those fellas. Bit of sugar for Jamie Wincup after a tough start to the weekend. Cam McConville will be pleased with that as well. Race three is coming up after the break, but the Chinese are really going to turn it on with a special opening ceremony that's coming up. Got a fantastic view of the action, and when these cars light up and leave the line, it's a great sound. It echoes from the roof in the stadium. It really sounds terrific. The story of this race is going to be one of tyres because race three, starting with three sets of tyres at the beginning of the weekend, qualifying onwards, so it's going to be a question of what do you have left? Do you have a decent set of tyres to do the second segment of this race? I know some people have been able to retain two brand new or very near to new tyres for the working side of the car after the compulsory pit stop is taken and uh, who's got what is very much going to dictate whether a result can be gained from this event. Listen to the roar. And the crowd are on their feet, Neil. This is a, a wonderful, wonderful moment. And Russell Ingle is one of the drivers to watch. That's the view here of a number of different teams and rivals in pit lane. He qualified 13th, finished race one in 13th after a difficult pit stop and a tough setup. But he worked his way forward to finish in sixth place in that last race. He feels that he's got some good tyres. His engineer Barry Hay spoke to me moments ago. He said they went diametrically a completely different way in their setup compared to uh, race one versus race two. Good job by the Tasman Motorsport or Dodo Racing crew to get Jason Richards out there. He will take the start of the final race. Darrell? As far as setup goes, Marcus Ambrose has done the same as Russell Engel. They've done some changes to that car. Ross Stone, I spoke to on the grid, he said, I think we're going to have more speed in this race. It should be a lot better. Also, Marcus had problem with his fan vent and his helmet, and he struggled with temperature in that car in race two. He spent some time on a drip between race two and this now race three, and he's all good. Interesting talking to the drivers during the break in between race two and now. Some felt the heat, others didn't. Let's check out the Talon Tough Tools grid. Scaife starts from pole. This is a reflection on where they finished in the second race. And some guys to keep an eye out for. Greg Ritter made up 13 places to finish 10th. As Greg correctly pointed out, Ingle made seven positions. So too did Seaton McConville and Paul Dumbrell, who isn't driving with a cool suit and said he didn't feel the heat. He feels fine. He says some of his peers should get out and run a little more. <laughs> 
know, it would be hot out there. I mean, you're talking the best part of 20, 25 degrees above the ambient temperature of the day inside the cabin. And uh, certainly you can train very hard and overcome part of that, but uh, there's not much you can do to fend off those sorts of temperatures unless you get a bit of assistance. So if Paul's not feeling it, then good luck to him. That's uh, not something the rest of them are boasting. Most of the fellas that I talked to were feeling the heat very much in the second longer race. And particularly, I think that it's very much a question if your car's not up to speed, Lee, then that preys on your mind and the mental aspect of that gets a bit tougher. If your car's behaving pretty well, which I think Paul's actually had quite a good car this weekend, but he's been a bit stiff and hasn't been able to use it. First two races different. Race one, 22 laps. Race two, 30 laps. This one is the same as the second. And this man here, Super Cheap Auto Racing's Greg Murphy, has a very large task ahead. Starting from the back of the field, so too Lowndes after that clutch failure. He's got some work to do from the back. While this man, Stephen Richards, inside the Castrol Perkins Commodore, starts up front alongside Mark Scape. He's had two blistering starts. Can he make it three from three? I bumped into Craig before the start of the race and he, he felt that uh, he'd probably induced the clutch drama himself. You've got to be very careful with a big fuel load and a tall dip in the car on a grippy circuit because if you do too many practice starts, you end up superheating the clutch, but it's almost the last thing you want is hot rear tyres at the start of this race. You actually want them to break free. Spin a little, help you get away. Yeah, I mean, you need the, you don't need any rubbish on the tyres, so you need to try and keep the, the tyre face as clean as you can, but actually bagging them up and making the rears too hot actually hurts you, and that, that can put a big stress on the clutch. Good job by the Orcon Racing Team. Jason Barguana will take the start of this race, albeit from pit lane. They have changed engines after it mysteriously stopped in race two. Rather than wasting time trying to find the problem, they elected to change it. That team's resources and their staff have been pushed to the max this weekend. I'm sure they'll be relieved to get through this one. So we wish Jason Barguana well. The interesting thing here will be the challenge on the front row of the grid. Mark Scaife, we've seen him at Eastern Creek and here this weekend, has not got away to the best of starts. So the pressure is on. And keep in mind, leading into this third and final race, Scaife, Richards and Todd Kelly are all tied on points for this round at 124 apiece. Winner will take this round, simple as that. Back of the grid, there's problems. There's problems on the left there. Anthony Tratt must be just out of his position, just not in the start box at the moment. They're pushing the car back. Someone's got their car sitting there on the rev limiter. They need to get out of that. Got to reset their minds. Clear now, thumbs up for the toll Commodore. He's almost out of position to the side of the box as well. Final race here in Shanghai. Scaife keen for a good start. Richards gets another blinder. That's three from three and they split Scaife. Kelly and Ambrose go one either side. Ambrose now and Kelly, it's a drag race to turn one. Kelly's got the inside run. Another shocking start for Mark Scaife who drops back to fifth position behind Russell Ingle. Stephen Richards has got it wide off the line. Big problems back in the pack here. Jason Bright is one of the cars. The Bright Tech car involved. That's the second time in two race meetings that he's ended up tangled up with one of his own cars. Matthew White, the driver on this occasion. I think it was Steve Owen at Eastern Creek. Jamie Wincup got away to a healthy start also. He's nicely in the mix. Probably about six places right in behind. Radisic Seaton got a nice one as well. Cameron McConville's in there. Greg Ritter, Paul Dumbrell, Max Wilson. But Stephen Richards, three from three. Thank Boy, you. is he good from the line. Our round winner from Barbagallo in Perth. Yeah, it's very cool. uh, I think that's a front headline unit on the ground at uh, turn one. So they settle into a rhythm now. Baird is up in a reasonable position around about the 15th mark. Rick Kelly well placed also, the best he's been all weekend, but they're all chasing Stephen Richards' damage to the front of Matthew White's car. And that headlight assembly's out of that car, and I just heard a report that it's on the road somewhere, so they may need to clear that before they come through. They're on the run down the back straight now for the first time, so look for moves in the braking area down to 12, uh, turn 12. All jostling for position, looking for the big inside run. Richards, Todd Kelly, Marcus Ambrose, Russell Ingle, Mark Scaife, Paul Radisic, Jamie Wincup playing with the big boys this weekend and doing well. 
Then it's Glenn Seaton, Cameron McConville. That's your top ten. I think Lowndes has got a misfire in his engine as well. Standing lap time for Stephen Richards at 155.3. Tight margin, 0.3 of a second back to Todd. He's right on him into the first corner. Marcus in there as well. This is the closest we've seen Ambrose to the front runners all weekend. And so too Ingle. Greg pointed out earlier, Ingle might be the front. Hold it, hold it, Ford, Ford. Castrol Perkins, HRT and the two Stone Brothers Fords. And dramas for Lowndes. So he's managed to whack somebody uh, on the opening lap. And he was also talking about a misfire. That's a lot of damage on the bottom of that car and probably around the top of the radiator. Yeah, there's uh, something coming out. We've lost water pressure as well, Craig. I think, I think she's dead, mate. That's Campbell. They're seeing that on the telemetry on the computer screens back in the garage. So they've picked that up and that'll be shut down and out of the car. Russell Ingalls running with his teammate Marcus Ambrose as well. Two Holdens, two Fords at the top. They're very evenly matched. Here's the Zinger replay of the start. Watch Richards. He's got it totally wired here this weekend. A good leap and away he goes. Notice that absolutely no wheel spin and escape an absolute shocker. How? Why? Why does that happen? Well, it hasn't quite got the throttle percentage and the engagement of the clutch right, the pickup point on the clutch. Maybe there's 101 reasons why a start can be messy. Speaking of messy starts, back in this pack, it got very congested here. And there's Matthew White. Looked like he might have got into the back of one of the BOC cars. So I think it was one of the BOC cars that actually tagged Jason Bright. I'm not sure whether that was John or 21, Brad. 21 it was Brad. Brad. Yeah. Another lap down in this 30 lap of the final one in Shanghai. And Richards has still been able to... Great run through turn one. Closes right up on the back of Todd Kelly. The radio message to Craig Lowndes from Roland Dane before this race started was let's just put all the dramas of race two behind us and try and get a result and some points. Gee, that's tough. Well, it is, uh, Rusty. It's sort of, um, you know, when you start back there, you're always going to be in, in uh, I guess, a high percentage of, uh, you know, having an accident. Uh, I don't know what happened in front of us, but it's a concertina effect. And uh, I, I really, I just try to uh, be really easy and gentle through turn one. I was following Dave Bernard. He stopped suddenly, which I don't know whether he hurt, uh, hit someone, but... Um, yeah, look, that's unfortunately the way it goes. The damage itself with the tight turnaround between here and Darwin, will it be hard for the Triple Eight team? No, I think the car's actually not that bad. It's, it's uh, busted a radiator, so uh, you know, although it looks bad, I think uh, it's very superficial. So uh, you know, we'll get it going and uh, see what happens. But uh, that's our weekend, so I'm looking forward to getting home to Nat and the kids. So uh, yeah, look, that's what happens. After a brilliant round at Eastern Creek, a tough run in Shanghai. Thank you. Yeah, the higher you are, the harder the fall. Round win at Eastern Creek two DNFs from three starts. He went from fourth in the championship to sixth before this race. Now that one will hurt him. The fastest man out there at the moment is actually Jason Bright. He's done a 52 neat, but nobody's got any great pace at this point. They won't have particularly flash tyres in this opening segment of the race, and it is substantially hotter. So a hectic opening couple of laps. And a tremendous start from Stephen Richards sees him out in front and leading this pack. You're watching the V8 Supercar Championship Series live from Shanghai, China. And the pressure is on. The day is done for WPS4 driver David Bernard. It's been a frustrating weekend, so he is over with. But at the front, it's far from over. Look at Stephen Richards, the defensive inside line. Kelly sweeps to the outside. These two came together, almost came together, and Kelly was able to get under him in the opening race. And Ambrose is lining up for a shot as well. Yeah, Marcus went back out for the traditional race line there and let the other two guys argue he's looking for the fast way round. Stephen was very defensive. Pulsary pit stop window is now open, so at some point you'll start to see various people peel in, but the makes for an interesting strategy, a strategy question for some of them. Murphy is talking on the radio at the moment about uh, high water temperatures. Hey, they're, asking in, to, they're asking him to find some cool air. He's back in 19th, tucked up behind John Bow. 
I think that was radio communication from Marcus Ambrose to his team. They've asked him to come in this lap, and he said, no, I don't want to stop. He is right in the mix. He's right in the thick of it. Spoke just a few moments ago to Phil Key, engineer for Jason Bright at Ford Performance Racing. He says of the bank of tyres they have left, they probably are running their best set now on Jason's car. They flat spotted a tyre in qualifying, or the last race I should say, so they're, they're down in rubber terms. And what they are definitely going to do is run the gauntlet here with Jason Bright, try and keep him out there as long as possible and uh, use that ploy in strategy terms. Certainly worked for him in the previous race with his teammate Greg Ritter, didn't it, Compo? Yeah, and I kind of guessed from his lap speed that he had his better set on now. And uh, from a strategic viewpoint, definitely better to just stay out there, do good lap speed. And uh, he's in the mid-51s, which is pretty handy. This is interesting. There's a bit of conversation going on with the Stone Brothers camp. They're telling Marcus Ambrose he has to pit now. Does he obey the orders? Yes, he does. The others come in as well. Oh, pressure's on the teams here. And watch this, because they can all run into each other very easily here. Oh, uh. Problems on the front bad. stretch. That's a bad move there, boys. Oh, Garth Tander. Well, Marcus. There's nothing I can do about it, mate, out of my control. And that was Ambrose saying it was bad a bad move. call. He's saying it's a bad move. Castrol team, good stop for Stephen Richards. Yeah, it sure was there, around about 4.8 seconds. They changed the tyres down the passenger side of that car. It's going to be interesting to see now if he can get out ahead of Marcus Ambrose. Well, Richards is right at pit in. He serviced. Ambrose is right at pit out. Marcus had good car speed. That's why he wanted to go on with it. He, he felt that he could make a few tenths in this clear segment now. And all he's going to do here is be mixed up in the pack unless wait, he can Marcus, jump Wait, 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 wait. Oh, no! He's hit Richards in pit lane. He's knocked over the markers. Yeah, it could be interesting. He, like you saw Lee did, he went for two tyres down the left-hand side. Paul Forky said, Marcus, wait, 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 but he kept going. Yeah, I don't know that race control will be too thrilled about that. We'll have to wait and see how they view it once they've had a good look at it. But uh, car controller was saying, wait, wait, wait. Here it is. Stephen Richards and Todd Kelly line astern. And at this point, Marcus needs to yield. Look at the officials having to jump out of the way. He nearly he, ran over Vinny. However, he did address it, and uh, he did lift the throttle on the exit so that he could slot in behind, but uh, Vinny nearly, <laughs> nearly wore the dunce's hat then, didn't he? <laughs> Good quick reaction. And we're hearing word that Rick Kelly is very. There is the team Buick entry. And they've just called Scaife pit this lap because it could be a safety car scenario so they're going to yank him in and rattle the wheels and tyres off that for left hand side only for scape trouble for ingle in the gravel and scape and ingle were together and there's Cito as well they're all diving for the pits there must be some there must be something all over the road there for the experienced guys to go off at the pit entry Wow, crazy stuff in race three. There's going to be a lot more to that story. I'd be curious to see what that was all about. At turn 14, you can go straight ahead there in the pit lane entry, and then it's got a 90 degree left that runs okay. down the hill. Scaife stop. Like clockwork. Go, go, you're right, you're right. Beautiful work safety from HRT. Car, safety, safety, car, safety car has been deployed. Good stop for Scaife. Seaton rejoins as well. Radisic service, both super cheap auto cars are in also. Escape in behind Ambrose. Mass congestion in pit lane at the time too with guys diving in and out of their respective pit boxes but someone who may have made some gains there I think was Cameron McConville. He came in behind Seaton, some slick work by the Gary Rogers crew got him out ahead. Seaton's car a little slower to come down off the jacks, both guys changing rear tyres. Paul Radisic, good stop for him. He went out behind Mark Scaife in the exit of pit lane. Also checking tyre temperatures a lot hotter today. But race two, the Dunlop boys said the temperature left rear was up around 85. Marcus Ambrose tyre that came off that car, especially the left rear, which is carrying the temperature, was only in the mid 70s. Dunlop surprised. Maybe that setup change was helping him with tyres, and he did have that pace. Russell Engel buried. And the right Patton Shakespeare safety car on track. This will tell us why. Look at the Zinger replay. Oh, he's got a tag. Whoa. Oh, dear. Well, I, that's going to be pretty straightforward. Mark right into the back of Russell Ingle and turns around the Caltex car into the gravel trap he goes. 
and uh, I think that you could almost bet the house on the fact that that'll be a penalty for Mark Scaife. That has massive championship implications as well for Russell Ingall because Stephen Richards, who's in the box seat to win this round. Mate, the call is for a safety car, so just don't panic too much. Just hang with me, will you? Sounds like he's got the engine running. It was Barry Hay communicating with Russell Ingall. You see anyone coming towards you? Or Russell, you just seem to be sitting there. And they're waiting for oh, the crew there. to arrive to help Russell Ingall out of that gravel trap. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back to Shanghai live right after this. Back at Shanghai, Russell Ingall has been rescued from the gravel trap and is in the Stone Brothers box now. Yeah, and they're doing all four. Russell was in debate with Barry on the way in to the pit lane as to whether they just do the rears only. He called for rears only, but there's gravel in it everywhere. Mate, turn it off, don't cook it up. I'll give you the nod when they get all this stuff out of here. So much gravel there in hey, the back. left front tyre is right. Do you want to stay on, mate? Just to confirm for you, I've spoken to the officials here in pit lane while the safety car is underway. The Marcus Ambrose incident on the exit of pit lane is under investigation. So is the clash here between Mark Scaife and Russell Ingall. A word from the officials is that it will not be adjudicated on until they finish dealing with the safety car period. They want to make sure that's under control first. Then they'll take a closer look at this happen happening here. Now, Rob Starr from HRT, the team boss, says to me, Mark Scaife reported nothing in the way of a problem break-wise on the entry to pit lane here. Scaife has said nothing about the incident thus far. Timely moment to welcome Triple Eight Racing's Craig Lowndes to the Network 10 commentary box. Welcome, mate. Glad to see you here rather see you out on the track what do you make of that incident well look it's uh, it's, it's it is an interesting um uh, corner because really you got uh, guys on race line trying to complete a lap guys trying to f uh, fire into uh, the pit entry as quick as they can and uh, it is a little bit of a drama because you've got to quite judge the guys actually that wanting to continue on a circuit or want the guys want to actually go up pit entry so um look, look like my opinion, just having a quick look at it there, looked like uh, Mark is in, in the wrong. Um, you know, he's taking, uh, well, he's hit uh, Russell, and then Russell's ended up in the gravel trap and ended up the worst of the two. It's been a tough weekend for you, hasn't it? Oh, it looks fantastic. I, I heard about you guys having an air conditioning uh, <laughs> room, so I thought I'd come and have a look. We, uh, yeah, definitely, we got a bad start. Um, Dave Bernard got me off the line and uh, ran into turn one. Uh, Roland Dane had, uh, had told me to just let's come on. Let's we'll, come over. we'll sort it out this end. try and consolidate and uh, you know get some points for the last race here and uh, we tried to do that I left a little gap and going into turn one there was a concertina effect I'm not 100% sure what went on uh, into uh, as we're watching Glenn oh. Seaton there hit the wall we actually did clap the wall so uh, quite the front right and it looked like he did it on his own so uh, he just I talked about this before Craig when I walked around the track the other day I could see that there was a bit of a recipe for disaster there because it's a uh, as the lights are out now on the safety car. It's a very fast approach. The grip level goes down when you come off the racetrack and it's a 90 degree left-hander. We're about to restart the race and there certainly was some drama there. Let's see what a pressure Kelly will apply. Will Ambrose have a shot? Stephen Richards is a man they are chasing and Kelly's been good down into one. So too has Ambrose. Ambrose argued the call to come in when he did. Look at Kelly on the inside. Marcus was very keen to stay out there with that extra speed that he had. He's given Todd a little tap there in the turn two part of that complex. He probably felt that he could have uh, made another couple of tenths or two on that set of tyres, but as it turned out when the safety car was deployed, I think this call has ended up being the correct one for Stone Brothers. Scaife is behind this man. Radisic is fifth, Wilson sixth, Ritter, McConville, Wincup, Seaton. That's the ten at the moment, but these four are out by themselves. Quite a few of the key players here have managed to hold back a minimum of a couple of decent tyres for this last segment of the final race. So very young or, or new tyres. Thoughts on the track, mate? Have you found it? Marcus Ambrose is going to get a black flag for uh, uh, the incident in pit lane and he'll get a drive through. So that was the reason just went quiet there for a moment. Sorry, Lee. That's all right. What do you think, Craig? Like it. Yeah, track's fantastic. It's very, it's got a high grip level. And uh, you know, we burnt the clutch up in the uh, first race today or the second race overall. And uh, you now that's why we started back the grid today. Um, very, very fast. We actually thought that it'd be a uh, quite clearly uh, some good, quite uh, clearly. Drive through, Marcus. Come through the pit lane this time. Through the pit lane. 
quite, quite clearly into, into this uh, hairpin. It'll be quite easy to overtake, but uh, as you can see, the cars are actually fairly even, so oh. Morris and Glenn Season. Yeah, that was on for a while. Paul was just sliding in for, for 100 metres or so there, and uh, he couldn't pull it up on the inside of the road, and he's given Glenn a tap, so it was as if it wasn't uh, tough enough for Seaton after making contact with the wall down there at Turn 14. He's now off the edge of the road, and Paul Morris has got a pile of damage on the front of the Cirame entry. Damage on the front of the toll Commodore as well. It's been a bit chaotic, this one, hasn't it? Uh, definitely. I think uh, you know everyone will go away this weekend and, um, and have a good look at what we did and, uh, you know, and what we've done over the weekend and come back next year a lot, lot smarter, a lot wiser. And uh, you know the cars will, uh, have been fantastic. There's a great crowd here. It's been sensational to see everyone come out and support us. It does sound like we're in for more drive-throughs here. It's not going to be just Marcus Ambrose. The word from the officials on the pit wall is that Mark Scaife will serve one shortly and also one for car 17, Stephen Johnson. And the reason for that is the, the absolute congestion in pit lane made it difficult for Stephen to exit and cross from the cement section onto the tarmac on, the, on this incredibly wide pit lane. So he went most of the distance down the lane on the concrete. They wanted him back over in the fast lane. That takes Scaife out of this equation if that is the case and it leaves it for Stephen Richards and Todd Kelly to fight over the round and it puts the rat up into third. And they're just processing these one at a time in, the, in my headset. Now they're going to give Stephen Johnson a drive-through penalty for what Greg just described, for driving through the slow lane in the pit lane. And I think next cab off the rank will be car two. They're just issuing it sort of like on a ticker tape there at the moment. As you can see now, going into turn 12, this, this uh, is a first gear hairpin, so you're going down from uh, 280 sort of plus kilometres an hour. First gear, accelerating very hard out of here, and that's probably your best opportunity for passing opportunities. So you can see Steve now, Steve uh, uh, Richards there, just uh, protecting his line, just sort of creeping over towards the middle of the track. He doesn't seem to have as much horsepower as the two cars behind him, but uh, he's done a fantastic job to keep his nose clean. Braking-wise and balance-wise, his car looks to have been pretty good all weekend, but uh, a good observation, Craig. I reckon he's maybe a couple of k's down on these blokes. Here we go, here we go. Great move, Todd Kelly. He'd been looking for many laps for that. Similar place to where he executed it yesterday, but perhaps 100, 150 metres earlier. He is now the new race leader. Boy, that was a slick move. Great move. It's a fantastic move into Turn 1. As you can see, he's already pulling away from Richo, so he must have been holding him up. Turn 1 is actually very, very uh, difficult in the sense that it tightens itself up, but you enter Turn 1 very, very quick. It's like a third gear right on the limiter, and, uh, you know, you actually car uh, wiggles and moves right around through one until it tightens up where you've got to go back to second, get it down into, into three. So it's a uh, quite difficult little corner. At West Point, Falcon of Stephen Johnson's is making the long trip down pit lane. Dick Johnson is with me. Your thoughts on what happened? It was so busy in pit lane at the time, obviously. Oh, right, I really don't know. I, just, uh, I don't even bother wearing a headset anymore. I get too upset. So it's um, it's a bit difficult. But uh, you know, you, you have good days and you have bad days. And uh, it looked as though it was going to be half a good one, but it's, it's turning the opposite way at the moment. Boys did a good job to get Stephen's car out on the grid for this race. And I know Glenn was looking through his tyre bank to see what his tyres were like for you know the final race. What's the the general thoughts on, on things in the final one, given you know, Glenn's scenario? Well, you know, Glenn obviously just got taken out then by uh, another you know, ambitious driver, and and uh, it seems to be uh, the nature of the weekend. But you know, we'll just keep trucking on and see how we go. Thanks, Dick. No Paul Wheel getting a tag there from I think Max Wilson in uh, turn one, and meanwhile Mark Scaife will get a black flag and will serve a drive-through. Richards trying to come back on Kelly. Curb hard. Something just happens to the tyre coming in. Mark communicating that he's coming in. The battle's on the front. We can't do any work on the car. This is a drive-through. If you've got damage, we, you then have to come back in. And look at this. We see the Team Kiwi Racing Commodore of Paul Radisic oh, no, in a podium position for the first I'm time in his new team. The... There are some surprises in this race. You've got Radisic in third, Max Wilson is fourth, Wind Cup is fifth, and Ellery fighting through. He's up into eighth. Mark almost went straight into the back of Richards. Now I know why he's been on the radio talking so much, and that's why he dropped out of that group. So that'll be a flat spot, I imagine, on those tyres, and just compounds what's turning into a disastrous third race for him. Look at this gap closing up. There 
goes Martin having served, but remember he's probably got some damage on those tyres and allowed to work on the car during the, the drive-through when you're serving a penalty. Talk about a mix-up at the top. You run down the order after the top three. Wilson, four. Wind Cup, five. McConville, six. Ritter, seven. Ellery, eight. Wright, nine. And Wills, ten. What a very different-looking top ten. Robbie Starr, that incident Mark just mentioned during his drive-through with the front left tyre. Was that during the Ambrose incident or the incident with Russell Ingle? No, this, the left front then, he just damaged then. He thinks we've richer at, at the moment then. But um, he, um, you know, obviously with the Russell thing, we're not, you know, it didn't look real good. And you know, we thought Russell was coming in and obviously he turned the corner. And, you know, the, the, the pit entry speed's a lot quicker than doing the corner. I guess the most difficult thing has been the starts for Mark more than anything to put himself in that position. Yeah, I mean, he, he, you know, it's obviously that anyone that's been on the inside of the track today seems to have struggled, and unfortunately, you know, as soon as you get one bad one, it, it gets harder as it goes on. So, you know, the car speed's been good, but unfortunately, you know, we have to get it. Todd Kelly leads the way, but there's some movers in the pack. Ritter's got past McConville in the Valvoline Commodore. And Ellery is coming. Simon Wills will get a drive through as well for that incident that we saw before in car 168. We are at the halfway point, race three, round five in Shanghai. We've got special guest Craig Lowndes with us, and we'll be back in just a moment. weekend has gone very sour for West Point Racing. Glenn Seat now in the pits. An unnecessary stop. And this is very costly for him. What was going to be a good result after he made very strong progress through the field is now over. And at the front of the pack there is plenty of pressure on. Todd Kelly is enjoying a handy margin of about two seconds over Stephen Richards. But Richards is under increasing pressure from Paul Radisic as the two Kiwis going at it for that second spot. And this is what recently happened to Glenn Seat. That's very unusual. I'm not sure what that's all about. It'll be something to do with the contact. Car number 67, Paul Morris, is going to get a black flag for a drive-through penalty as well. So plenty of people visiting the pit lane for an extra time this afternoon. This is an outstanding run from Paul Radisich, isn't it? There's the margins, first, second, third, fourth. Another great run again for Jamie Wincup. Well, this is fantastic from Jamie Wincup to be in that position while we're away. He put on a very sophisticated move on Wilson. Meanwhile, look at the rat pushing Richards along, just giving him a friendly nudge, saying, I'm here and I want through. Increases that margin, 2.2 seconds the lead. And Wincup isn't out of a top three spot. He is reeling Radisic in. Wincup's the fastest of these lead guys, but Jason Bright's still in the 51s. He's eight, 51-6 on the last lap for him. The Shanghai experience is over early for both Triple Eight Falcons. Craig Lowndes is up in the commentary box. Stephen, you're here with us in pit lane. What's happened to your car? I'm not 100% sure. Um breaking down in the hairpin in the car, just wanted to pull left, so something in the front suspension's broken, but, um, you know, it's so disappointing I was going to win that, but um, nothing was going to stop me today, but um, unfortunately it did, and just seems to be the way we just got no luck, but um, working hard. I feel sorry for the boys more than anything, um, but, you know, maybe next time. And uh, I just want to say um, hello to Kerry and the boys at home. Hard luck, Stephen Ellery. Daryl? Keys well. Greg Murphy's not probably had the best of weekends so far. You've made an engine change in that car and he's come from 31st now up to 10th. Yeah, no, it's uh, been pretty good on that side. We've had a pretty disastrous day up until then, but uh, no, we, uh, we're pretty hard over the break between the two races and uh, whipped another motor in and plus a fair few other things that were broken. So uh, for Murph to do a good job now, it's sensational. What about that car? There was talk at Eastern Creek, you were thinking about putting the Larry engine in that car as well. You've still got the 18 degree engine in it. When, when will it take the new engine or why didn't you do it? Well, we didn't do it this weekend because of the few, we only had a few days to turn the cars around and uh, 
yeah, I guess we're stuck for time there and, and there's nothing wrong with the 18 degree engine at all and it's done a great job and as you can see the one we put in today has been doing an excellent job as well so it will change between now and uh, Darwin so it should be good for Darwin. Thanks Keith. Thank you. Cheers. It's Paul Morris exiting pit lane. Give credit to his driver too, talking to Keys wheel there. Greg Murphy has come from the back of the yeah, pack there, to be in the top uh, ten in ninth place as, Mur as uh, Morris rejoins. There's quite a bit of reward for a number of drivers here who have been down on luck in the recent past. You know, Radisich up here in third, Wind Cup in fourth, Max Wilson driving the Tony Longhurst car, the team dynamic entry in the fifth, Greg Ritter, Cam McConville. Good to see some variety. And here's a great move by Jamie Wind Cup down the inside of Max Wilson at that hairpin that Craig was talking us through before, which is a great passing opportunity here. That was very Lowndes-esque. You pulled on Ambrose, mate. <laughs> yeah, at first, uh, the brake marker I did on uh, Marcus was a little bit more, uh, I guess, in, you almost say desperate than that one. Uh, Jamie had a, uh, a very clear run into uh, that hairpin, but look, he's done a great job. He's running around at fourth at the moment, still pulling some good times, it, very identical to the leaders. This is all that remains of the right rear tyre that came off Glenn Seaton's West Point Racing Falcon. As you can see, it's absolutely disintegrated. Just some small remnants of the sidewalls on this Dunlop tyre. I've had a word to the crew that work on car 18. They tell me this, they believe, is a result of bodywork damage bodywork on the tyre. Remember, Glenn had that off coming into pit lane and clouded the wall. They believe the bodywork down the side of the car was damaged and it's eventually cut that tyre away. Looking back at Paul Radisic, this would be his best finish for Team Kiwi if he can stay where he is. The guy behind him, it's his best ever result if he can stay there in the Dodo Commodore. I think Glenn Seaton's going to get a penalty here as well. Yeah, Car 18 confirmed the drive-through penalty, so maybe um, pit lane infringement, I understand, for Glenn Seaton. And the wow Commodore for Max Wilson, the little Brazilian. He's running hot as well. And we've got just over 10 laps to go here live in Shanghai. We've seen plenty of action already in the previous two races. And this is the final 10 laps now here at the Shanghai International Circuit. What a race for Max. Max Wilson in the wow Commodore considering his opening race of the weekend ended prematurely with fluid gushing from the front of the car. It is going very nicely now. Great recovery, 14th in race two, and now up here in fifth place, big bundle of points here. Talking of points, the way they stand at the moment, Todd Kelly would be the round winner. If he stays where he is, Stephen Richards second, and it'll be a newcomer to the podium for this year, Paul Radisich in third place, and I think I need to double check my stats, but if Todd Kelly wins this race, I think that's the 50th round win for HRT. You'll actually have your name against quite a few of those back in the old days. Thank you. And it'll be the first Just round trying to find win. some positives for you, mate. <laughs> you put a bit of a positive spin on your afternoon. It'll be the first round win for HRT since Hidden Valley last year. And that was Todd as well. Yeah, it was. Greg Riddis had a successful weekend especially after his result in the first race. Now it's even better, he sits sixth, and this isn't a challenge for position. Paul Morris is out of the equation. Meanwhile, these two guys, the Stone Brothers pair, are trying to force their way back through the field. Greg. An unfortunate end to the weekend for the Dodo Racing Team entry of Jason Richards. This crew did a wonderful job to get it out there for the final race. What's happened? Yeah, it looks like we've had an engine uh, failure. The um, oiling system for one of the rockers is fractured, and it meant the rocker didn't get receive any oil, and then eventually it seized up. So I think that's linked to the previous accident, Jason, in race two? I don't think so. I think a fracture of the oil line, you know, is, is, is probably something different. I mean, you never know. I mean, obviously it wouldn't have helped Rusty, but uh, it's just a shame. We had such good car speed out there, and, uh, and it's just uh, another weekend. It's just gone begging. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, mate. He's a guy that uh, should have had better results this year. His car's been good, he's very fit, he works very hard at it, but for some reason he just keeps being Johnny in the wrong spot at the wrong time. It's very unfortunate for him. Well, his teammate has a very big smile on his face at the moment. If he can stay in there for another keep eight laps. Keep blazing on, Marcus, you're making up good point. You've got a pretty quick car, just keep going and keep overtaking. See, Marcus at the moment where he's 16th on for 148 points, and that's the reason they're hustling him. And uh, this is for position on Anthony Tratt, 15th. 
Craig Lowndes, are you a guy that likes a lot of radio contact in between? We hear it up here between you and Campbell Little, or you'd rather less? No, no, I actually, as a driver, like uh, as much information getting sent to me as possible. You haven't heard a reply from Marcus, but, uh, you know, Cam has always said to me, if, if I don't want to talk, or if I'm in the middle of a corner, just press the button, they can hear that, so they at least know that we've, uh, we've heard the message and they can get on with it. Russell Ingalls is going to be heading into the pits pretty soon. The team waiting in the garage here. They've got covers to cover the engine. We know they are going to take the airbox cover off the engine on that car. They've got screwdrivers. They're not exactly sure what is wrong with it. Also, Mark Skastein had a front left-hand wheel out for that car for the damage he did earlier on. They took it back in. Say, Mark, st uh, Mark Skaste, stay out and get points because you're ahead as Mark Ambrose in the championship. Now the wheel is back out, so it looks like Skaste will be in. Yeah, I just got a confirmation over the radio that they're going to bring Mark in because uh, he feels that the tyre is dangerous at the moment. He and Marcus both share 148 points, but they feel because of his lack of speed that he's going to be passed anyway, so you may as well come in and get it serviced. That was the current update, but you never know. They have been known to change these things on the run. Zinger replay here. Jason Bright getting on the inside of Cameron McConville. Bright hasn't mucked around in this third and final race either. Bright started 20th in the Cat Ford, and that was a position move for seven. It started out a bit wild, though. He had to yeah, catch he had it the wobbles. When he first jumped on the brake pedal, it wanted to swap ends with him, but he brought it back under control. I had a feeling for a minute there he's going to whistle on by the corner with an extra 30 or 40 k's, but he got the job done. He did a great job going in the brake market because really that is the only place that uh, you know you can do some passing opportunity. But you've got to be careful. You've seen Mark Scaife lock a wheel, and uh, when you lock a wheel around here, you've got to come into the pits. Murphy grabs McConville also. So the great run for Greg Murphy from the back of the pack through, and he got through on the same corner at the hairpin that uh, Bright got McConville as well. One thing I noticed uh, in the first race was that your car was very good when it came to being you know, hungry and using a lot of the road. You were able to pound over those curbs like that one we saw there at turn 12 and the same at the final corner. You could brush right up against the tyres. You've got the, the damping working very well on that car and it's not a rough track but over the bumps provided by the ripple strips you were flying. Yeah, we had a good race car this weekend, and uh, you know, as uh, Stevie Allery said, it's a, bit, it's a shame for the boys. Uh, you know, we come here and we got told that uh, eight was a lucky number, and uh, well, that's been unlucky for us this weekend. But uh, you know, as, as you heard Dick say, sometimes you win them, sometimes you lose them. For us, we'll get on with it. Uh, but we did have a great car. Scaife receiving, receiving the necessary fix on the front left for that massive lockup we saw at the end of the back straight, just before he served his drive-through penalty. Now that's done and he can get on with the final seven laps of this event. A bit crestfallen, I'm sure, you know, starting in such a strong position going into this final race and then you know, making that error, touching up Russell, popping a penalty, flat spotting a tyre. Some evil starts, so it's something that he needs to work on with the team. Steve Ellery, your teammate down in... Uh, it looks like he's, he's got, they've got him back, back out, out on the track, yeah. so uh, you know, it's great for the boys to be able to get uh, one of the cars running around and circulating and uh, giving us, uh, if anything, good data for next year. It's something that, uh, as I said uh, earlier, that uh, really uh, come back next year. I think every team will be a lot better prepared. Over the course of the weekend, the Gary Rogers Motorsport crew have made some fairly aggressive changes to car 33 of Cameron McConville. They initially started with a, a softer spring setting and then worked with a heavier rear bar. Then they went completely the other way. But they found the car offered nothing in, in either setup term in terms of a benefit for Cameron McConville. Now in the later stages of these races, he's finding that the car tends to fall over on its on its left rear tyre through these closing radius corners. No word on the radio from Cameron to his engineer, Phil Curtis. Phil just looked at me a moment ago and said, hey, sorry, we're not fast enough. The guy who is quick at the moment is still Greg Murphy, 51-6 on the last lap for Greg in eighth position. The leader of the race, Todd Kelly, 52-1, 52-1 also for Stephen Richards, 152-3 for Paul Radisich. So Greg continues to march along. He's closing up on Jason Bright in seventh at the moment. If they stay as they are, it will be a podium not only for the race, but for the round for Paul Radisich and Team Kiwi Racing. And that would be a best for that team in the history, the short history of that team. The other fellow in the 51s, just like it was in race one, a bloke who was in the mid to high 51s was you, you lunatic. And uh, right at the end of the race, you were flying, but a 51-6 for Ambrose. So that car's strong at the end. It is, and it's something that, uh, you know, you've got to be careful over the course of the race. Yesterday it was only 22 laps, today it's 30 laps. And, uh, you know, although I, ha although I haven't done a lot of sweating uh, today, but uh, really it's uh, 
you've got to be very careful with your tyres, you've got to look after them, you've got to get your pit stop out of the way, you've got to get a good car balance and then into a rhythm and uh, look after the car. When we were on board with Greg then you could see a lever up off the steering column up behind the top left hand corner of the steering wheel. That's a handbrake that a lot of the cars have in them and the drivers use them to help launch them away off the start. They actually put the car in first gear, load up the clutch a little bit and use the handbrake and then release the handbrake to get the car away. Uh, some people are finding that aids them at the start. I know you don't want to talk about it, but do you have something like this in your car? Yeah, we definitely do. We've got a button, though. We, uh, there's a passing opportunity going just through end of turn two into three. Yeah. So that was uh, Bright on his teammate Greg Ritter, I think, for position. Yeah, so you've got one of these doobies? Yeah, we got a, we got a button, and uh, you know, like everything in motor racing, you have to try and find the, uh, the your best advantage you can, and starts are becoming very, very critical. Just a reminder, while we're on board with Greg Murphy, for all of you who have spent $30 or more at Super Cheap Auto and have entered the V8 Muscle Car Mania Comp, here's your chance for some bonus entries once again. HSV LS2 is the code word for this weekend. You can see it just there on the left on Murph's dash. SMS it to 1977 51 51 in Australia or 88 44 in New Zealand. And look at Murph on the inside of Greg Ritter. He's chasing Jason Bright. And this forward surge continues for Greg Murphy. It's going well, isn't it? It's a great recovery after a shocker. And we always thought that he was going to be strong here from his speed early in the weekend. But just uh, race two was pretty shocking for him. But he's on the march. Well, obviously, HRT have made the right decision as far as Mark Scaife goes for championship points. This tyre, you can see the different layers, the outer rubber of the tyre, then the belt, and it's down to the metal here. There's a bubble here. It was about to explode at any time, I guess. So it could have done huge damage to that car if this had a flown apart down that fast back straight. Greg Murphy was on the braking limit then into the hairpin turn 12. Uh, Craig, he didn't have a millimetre left under brakes. No, it's actually, uh, it, like, although it's a hard braking, you've got a lot of runoff area, but, uh, but yeah, Murph, as you can see, the car was really squirming around on the brakes and he was uh, using everything he's got. A 52.6, but remember, he was mixed up with traffic there on that lap, so he's now to seventh and chasing Bright. So the order is Todd Kelly, Steve Richards, Paul Radisich, Jamie Wincup, Max Wilson, Jason Bright, Greg Murphy, Greg Ritter, Cam McConville, Brad Jones into the 10 as well, so that's a little bit of sugar for Brad. Let's keep an eye on the front too, because Stephen Richards is gradually eating into Todd Kelly's lead. He only has four laps left, but it's down now to the closest margin it's been in some time, only 1.3 seconds. Has Richo saved something to the end? Brad was 13th after the first practice, and then he said to me at the end of uh, Friday, oh, I'll drop my usual 20 spots when it comes to qualifying, and he did, so he qualified 29th. Then finished 25th in race one, 17th in race two, and now inside the top 10 for race three. So again, he's demonstrating that at the end of the weekend, they can get the car to work pretty well, but it's not strong enough in the early part. Jamie Wincup isn't letting Radisic get away either. What a performance from those two guys. And it has been, I'm sorry to say this, Craig Lowndes, it's been a Holden weekend. Well, it, has, it has been, and uh, when you really look at the, uh, the section of the circuit, the Commodores are, are, have got a nicer flowing car through the middle part of the circuit. Down this back straight, there's not a lot in it, and under brakes and everything else, but, uh, you know, look, they've done a, uh, all teams have done a great job. They come here green with no data, no reference from last year, and uh, really to, uh, to get it right on the day, everyone's made tweaks and uh, some changes as the, as the weekend in the course of the, uh, the, the races have gone on. Russell Ingall's got a brake drama with this car, and I think Scaife's on the radio complaining about having trouble pulling his car up as well. He's just in front of your teammate here. He is running off. This time he doesn't lock up. He actually just runs wide, chooses to run wide. But there's some issue with the car, probably as a result of the contact with Russell. Here we are on board with him. But Ingall's just going to cruise through to the end now. They've actually had a few brake issues this weekend. They were fiddling. Marcus told Daryl in an interview yesterday that he would be uh, mucking around with brake master cylinders. They've been trying different brake pads, as I understand it. They opted for something more aggressive to pull him up more efficiently down into turn 12. But a few people finding that it's tricky to get a good brake balance for at this track. Well, it's something you've got to be uh, conscious of at the start of the race with uh, a lot of fuel in the, uh, the back of the car. And as, as the, uh, the, the fuel load comes out of it, the tyres start to degrade. So you've got to then play with the bias, play with your, uh, your sway bars, try and keep a happy medium. This is down to 1.1 seconds now. I'd suggest it's less than that. Richards is definitely catching Todd Kelly. Kelly has had some very impressive pace this weekend, whether it be up against his teammate Mark Scaife or Stephen Richards in the opening race of the weekend. But now the Castrol car is closing in, that is for sure. 
see that Todd's just battling in the mid corner at the moment. Quite obvious in that early part of the turn, but how encouraging is this? Uh, is this? We've got different drivers, different car team combinations, uh, all so incredibly close at the back end of this third race, and a couple of fresh names just for Spice. Well, it's interesting when you look at the, uh, the finishing races of race one, race two. Richo didn't, or wasn't as quick after the pit stops as probably what he'd like, but he definitely comes on strong towards the end of the race, and you can see that now. Todd's scooted away, but now everyone's now caught back up Catching. to him, whether he's used up all his tyres. In the middle sector, Stephen was three tenths quicker on this lap. Interesting to see what they click over as they go across the control line to complete the lap. Yeah, that's speedy. 51-1. It's the fastest lap of the race for Marcus Ambrose. And uh, he continues to circulate very quickly. 52-3 for Todd. 52 even, so he was three tenths of a second quicker on this lap. And then Radisich a 52 even as well. 51.99 for Jamie Wincup, so he's still pushing very hard. Just Max Wilson a 52.4, Greg. Just to expand on Craig Lowndes' point there about Stephen Richards, absolutely spot on. His crew chief Barry Ryan cornered me yesterday and said, look, we're really, really impressed with the way this car comes on in the latter part of the race. It's good on a, on a lighter fuel load. And uh, in, incredibly for, for Stephen, the key thing, he said, he really kind of called me, he said, listen, the key thing for us was finishing ahead of our rivals in the championship. It's about points for us here. And that's exactly the point, because Stephen Richards in every race this weekend has finished ahead of Marcus Ambrose and Russell Engel. And with their terrible run in this third race, although Ambrose has responded to bounce back up to 13th, Richards is in a very strong position. That's a flash lap time from Marcus, isn't it? On lap 28 to do a 151.18. It's very encouraging at this late stage. A little bit of anger in that too, wouldn't there? <laughs> Still some residual anger. I think you'll see, uh, and you might notice now, that it's two laps to go. I think Richard may run out of uh, laps. Although he may catch up to Todd, uh, you know, he'll have to put a bit of pressure on him in the last lap to, uh, to make a passing opportunity. Todd Kelly will win the round if he stays where he is by two points over Stephen Richards. He's as close as he's ever been. Strong under brakes, isn't he? Richards probably, as I said uh, before, he's probably the best person in our category. Uh, very, very, uh, not desperate, but very, very late. Look at this, they're coming round. There's only one lap to go. The leader is on his last lap. It's all here, it's all now for Stephen Richards. Can he do something about Todd Kelly? This is for the winner of the round. Pressure's on here, and uh, the move, the obvious move that could be made is down into the hairpin turn 12, and Todd will already be thinking about that, and he'll make sure he's positioned accordingly. But Stephen definitely starting to close down that gap. Guess who's here to gather it all up if these two tangle? Paul Radisich is in the box seat as well. Final lap here in Shanghai. What a weekend it has been. What a week it's been for everyone involved. Radisich closes the gap now on Richards. Jamie Wincup still in the mix also. See, Stephen's got his hands full with Paul at the moment as well. In fact, just in this last couple of corners, the pressure's come off Todd a little bit, and now the focus is on the battle for second, third, rather than first and second. And Wincup wants his first top three result ever. Fourth will be his best ever, but he's not satisfied with that. What a weekend for Radisic also. Half a lap left to run. Huge weekend for the guys in third and fourth and their respective teams, Team Kiwi and the Dodo Racing Team. Todd Kelly is on his way to becoming our fifth different round winner in as many starts. Ambrose won in Adelaide, Murphy won in New Zealand, Richards won in Barbagello, the guy in between Trompo and I won at Eastern Creek, Craig Lowndes that is. Big breaking duel here, Wind Cup, Radisic defensive. That was his last roll at it. And they all managed to do it without tearing each other apart, which was good. They had a go, but no damage done. And I think Todd Kelly is now safe and a round win for him, and I believe this will be the 50th round win for HRT. History at Shanghai, first time ever we've had five different round winners in as many starts. Kelly cleans up in Shanghai for HRT. Richard second, Radisic third, and that puts Team Kiwi Racing on the round podium as well. Some would say it's very good for the championship. Well done, guys. Top stuff all weekend, really, really good. The words from Stephen Richards, but the HRT boys are celebrating, and rightly so, their first round win in a year.
Jeff Gregg right in the middle of his man. Good stuff for those boys. You know a lot of those guys, Craig. It means a lot. What a familiar face, and as you said, it's been a long time between drinks for these guys. And uh, as you've mentioned, first uh, five rounds of championship, different winners every every round, and uh, is it, that's just how tough the categories you got. What a start. We checked the VB scoreboard. Kelly Richards Radisic. That's what the podium will look like. And Jamie Wincup, well done. Best ever result in a V8 supercar. And Max Wilson for Wow Racing. That is a wow. Top five for him. Tony Longhurst and the gang will be delighted with that. Time to celebrate for Todd Kelly. What a weekend. The first ever driver to win in Shanghai. Wins two of the three races and the round overall in front of a huge crowd here at Shanghai International Circuit. We check the VB scoreboard for the championship points. Less than 100 between the Stone Brothers pair and only 10 points between Russell Ingle and Stephen Richards. It's tight at the top. Scaife maintains his fourth. And courtesy of this round win, Todd Kelly moves into the top five. Let's go to Darrell. Well, Marcus, I guess, first of all, we can hear you on the road here saying, I don't want to come in for this stop. You came in and then you had that incident, so disappointed. Yeah, look, the incident is just a consequence of coming in with those other guys. You really should have waited a lap got some clean track and then uh, try to get track advantage. Had a really fast car, fastest lap uh, most of the race there. And that's way it goes, you know, it's a tough sport. You felt like, you know, earlier on you had pressure on those guys. You did have the car speed. And what about those times at the end of the race? Yeah, well, I was pretty hot under the collar and, uh, you know, I was just trying to make up as many spots as I could. It's a shame for the whole team, you know. Um, no one's trying to do the wrong thing. It's just uh, one of those deals. Well done, Marcus. Thanks, mate. He may not have won the round, but judging by the cheers in the Dodo Racing Garage, he may as well have. Congratulations, Jamie Wincup. That's a fantastic result for you and for this crew. Yeah, thanks, Rusty. It's great. We, you know, the whole team have been working really hard. We've forever been improving all year, and it's fantastic to be here at this awesome facility and to get the Dodo car right up the front. I'm really, really happy, and the whole team is too. What was it like toward the end of the race there? You had good pace, and there was maybe a move on with Paul Radisic. Yeah, I, I, I thought there might have been a possibility there. Like, the three cars were getting uh, bunched up in front of me. Maybe we could have got a, a third position, but, hey, force is great. We're happy, the whole team's happy, and you know, we can walk away with, with a bit of confidence walking in the next couple of rounds. Go and celebrate in Shanghai tonight. Congrats. Hey, Trusty. Boys? Yeah, what a super performance from that young fellow. That will really give the team a lift and a very successful weekend for Dodo Racing. Well, they're cooling off, they're grabbing a drink, and they are celebrating the people who finished up the front, that is. We will have the presentation and more celebrations when we return live to Shanghai. Stick around, we'll have a complete wrap-up for you. This fabulous, fabulous crowd at the Shanghai International Circuit has just been treated to an amazing V8 supercar race. That third and final one of the day, what a ripper. And we can't hit home enough. Five different round winners in the first five races of the five, first five rounds of the year. Todd Kelly, the most recent victor. And HRT and Holden celebrating, and rightly so. But just look at this magnificent venue. I said the celebrations would continue. They are. We go to Greg Rust with the presentation. Supercar here in Shanghai, our first ever series of V8 supercar races. What a wonderful round. We have enjoyed it immensely. First and foremost, we would like to present to Mark Scaife. He is the winner of the Rado Watches Fastest Lap Award. A tremendous result for Mark considering what has been a tough weekend to present the trophy the vice president of Rado Watches here in China Mr Oliver Hill so congratulations to Mark Scaife as he collects the trophy now for the fastest lap award well done to Mark we'll move along to third place for the round a wonderful performance by the Team Kiwi Outfit, and they are delighted to have their man on the podium. Please give a nice welcome round of applause to Paul Radisic. <laughs> Paul, congratulations. Thanks, Rusty. Uh, great first time Team Kiwi on the podium. I just feel awesome. I'm uh, suffering a bit from food poisoning this morning, and uh, I just, just kept going. I got two laps, one lap, one to go. Thanks to Team PMM, 
TKR, great job. Let's hope it's a start of a few more to come. Jump up there on the podium and to present the third place trophy, Mr. Zhang Huang, the Greenland Group President. And to present the third place wreath, we also have Chris Covey, the Executive Vice President from GM in China. So thank you to Chris. And we'll move along to second place for the round while the presentations continue here. Well done to Paul Radisic. But a great effort by the Castrol Perkins driver in Stephen Richards. He put up a gallant fight for second, but he claims second for our first visit to Shanghai. Well done, Stephen. And the car was a jet towards the end there, as it has been throughout all the races, and you gave it your all. You know, it was a great day for us, um, you know, to come here to this fantastic facility. A really big thanks to the Greenland Group and Tony Cochran for getting us here. Thanks to Castrol, Alden, and, uh, you know, things are forging on for us. It's really good. Certainly good for you in championship points terms. We'll let Stephen take his rightful place, second on the podium. And to present the, the trophy, we have uh, well, Terry McEnroth, the Deputy Premier of Queensland. He is here. And also to... Mr. Zhang Zhaidu, the Vice Mayor of Shanghai, presenting the trophy. Terry McEnroth, of course, the wreath. But the winner of this opening round in Shanghai, fifth round of the Championship Series. Please give a nice welcome round of applause from the Holden Racing Team. They're back on top of the podium. Todd Kelly! Well, after what's been a number of tough rounds for you, that must feel good. Yeah, it's a uh, fantastic place to uh, get another round win under the belt. Thanks to uh, Holden, Mobile and HSV and all the guys down there. Top job, well done, boys. Todd Kelly takes the top spot on the dais in Shanghai, China. Winner of our first ever V8 supercar round. Holden's dominating the podium. And Mr Yu Zai, the Minister for China Sports, will present the trophy to the winner of this round, Todd Kelly. We would now also like to call on, please, Senator Robert Hill, the Minister for Defence in Australia, to present the wreath as we take you back to Lee. Well, the, Hol the Holden Racing Team organised a massive tour for their fans here to Shanghai this weekend, and they will go home back to Australia. Very satisfied tourists, that's for sure. Congratulations, Holden Racing Team. Congratulations, Holden. Congratulations, that man there, Todd Kelly. The toddler is back. Champagne would taste very, very sweet for Holden Racing Team's Todd Kelly. It's been a year since the Red Army has won, and it was that man there that provided the win at Hidden Valley last year. Now he's done it in another exotic location, Shanghai, China. Back here live in pit lane, I'm joined by Chairman of Avesco, Tony Cochran. Well, Tony, they said you shouldn't do it, they said you couldn't do it. What do you have to say now? Uh, to all those journalists back in Australia that wrote us off, told us we weren't the world's greatest touring car championship, you can now go and eat all your words because about 50 odd thousand people here in China today have had the best day of their lives. We are so proud. This is a great Australian sport. And to take it to the world, this is the world's greatest touring car championship and the teams, the drivers, everybody who's put in so hard here, I can't be happier and congratulations to everybody. I'm a really proud Australian today, let me tell you. It's great for the championship, isn't it? So terrific. Uh, Lee, you know, I mean, this was doing the, the, the hard yards right up front and we've done it, we've pulled it off. Uh, We've just really broken through a brand new level. There's only three uh, forms of uh, sport, motorsport touring this world. Formula One, MotoGP, V8 supercars. It's a very healthy crowd here today. They have loved it. Well, it's time for us to leave Shanghai. On behalf of Neil Crompton, Daryl Beatty, Greg Rust, the entire team here in Shanghai, I'm Lee Diffie. We send you back to Billy Woods. Well, of course, now there is talk of Dubai and uh, the next day, perhaps even the world. but. Talk about this day, it's only just begun really if you're into motorsport, so let's take a look at what's ahead. MotoGP firstly is going to be a very, very exciting race in Catalonia where the local rider Sete Gibanao has taken pole position but sharing it with two men who have been in red hot form, Marco Melandri and indeed the faraway championship leader Valentino Rossi.
That makes up the grid of 21 riders and it's coming to you from Barcelona, round six tonight, after sports tonight. Check your guides for details, of course, at 11.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. And Formula One is coming to you a little later than that. We have the round from Montreal. We're flying away from Europe again. And Jensen Button has taken pole position and a comeback of sorts for Michael Schumacher as well, joining him on the front row. Mark Webber down in 14th on the grid. So that'll be a very, very interesting race indeed. We have no idea at this stage what the fuel loading is, but we suspect Button is running a little light, but the strategies will play out at 2.30. Check your guides for details, of course. The times will vary across Australia. That is coming to you live because it's in American time. Round six of the V8 supercars is from Hidden Valley in Darwin. That's Sunday, July 3. Check your guides for details, but of course, three races there. And there'll be lots to talk about in Darwin when V8 Superstars goes to one of the hotbeds of Australian touring car racing support. And that is, of course, the Northern Territory. Monday, July the 4th, tickets are on sale and you can ring the usual numbers and check it out on the rpmlive.tv website for more details. In the meantime, it's goodbye. for merch. I reckon they're a great fashion statement. <laughs> Not a great deal about to get hit by a train, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see your dress sense has not improved. 